covenant of simplicity and uh, the eternal comfort. Uh, and primarily the hack would be maybe where you know, that's too late. Um, started this company last year to write a tutorial for that episode. So we brought some pretty amazing technology that we've seen. Uh, remote access for those of you that registered and uh, uh, are listening uh, from all over the place. Uh, so uh, we will have a webcam going, and this will be streaming over YouTube. So anything you can, uh, anything you say can and will be used against you. Be careful. Uh, uh, you will be broadcast here, uh, so just be, be aware of that. But again, thank you for coming. People have come from uh, pretty far. Uh, we've got uh, somebody from uh, London, from uh, the Netherlands. Who, who came from the farthest for this? Any, anybody want to claim for the longest trip? You might get a door fight or something. I don't know what it would be. But, uh, anyway, so. Thank you all for coming, and I, I imagine some people will be streaming a little bit late. Um, we took a little bit of a break from uh, Urbanson user meetings. Uh, we've had them the last uh, couple of years in Europe, actually, but from the uh, Sustained City project that we've been involved in there. Uh, but it's been more, more of a research community and European uh, and, uh, further reach there. But the last one we had was uh, also uh, here in the Bay Area, is at UC Berkeley. And before that, we had one hosted at the uh, Puget Sound Regional Council. And um, we had one in San Antonio. That was the first one. Uh, so I'm happy to sort of get reconnected with everyone. And uh, I think this will be uh, really interesting to hear from users of Urban Sim what you've been doing and how you've been surviving the process of doing regional plans and uh, forecasts and engaging with your communities, uh, and what kind of challenges you encounter in that process. And we're going to try to interleave those discussions about actual use with um, some discussions about what we've been cooking up in our labs and uh, developing with new technology. And I hope you'll find that interesting as well. Um, so in this first session this morning, we have uh, uh, hopefully a really uh, lively discussion about uh, working on the front lines of getting regional transportation plans done um, and uh, all the challenges therein, uh, and how three of the MPOs that are here today have uh, gone through the process and uh, uh, whether or not they survived it and, and just so possibly some lessons learned. So um, I'd ask uh, Mike Riley and David Ori to go first and represent our hosts. We are in the offices here of uh, MTC and ABAG. I guess this is a shared auditorium for both. Uh, so I want to thank them very much for uh, allowing us to use their space. Uh, this is a perfect setup for the size of the group and uh, very generous of you to do that. So. Uh, I'm going to turn it over first to Mike Riley. Uh, David Ori is here, and uh, I think you're going to be answering questions and maybe throwing questions at Mike. Uh, oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, so we'll start off with Mike, and uh, <coughs> uh, I want to just say uh, that, that we endured together a, a pretty challenging couple of years as uh, we were working on Plan Bay Area. So uh, it'll be fun to just sit and listen to this for a while. So, Mike, take it away. <coughs> Hi. Hey, hello, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Welcome to the Bay Area. Thanks for coming. Um, and uh, I, you know, when I was talking to Paul this morning, I, I was kind of realizing that this is, I, uh, I distilled our history. Maybe I don't want to forget it already. It was a pretty painful uh, few years there. Um, and so I'm going to present some kind of like, uh, you know, thoughts after reflecting back a bit. But some of you already are asking for more details, and I can definitely go into that in the questions or later on. Um, so, I'm going to give a brief background of what we did here, um, but not, again, not, not the nitty gritty. We can talk about that later. Some lessons learned, things I think, you know, if I'd known in the beginning would, would have helped a lot. And a very brief next steps, an even briefer conclusion. So, and I apologize, uh, my, I have gotten 10 bowls somehow. 
the stem bullets after uh, moving off of the iPad. <laughs> yeah. But um, so you have ten points to make. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm just like casting. If anyone, uh, why, or so, if anyone wants to get on the uh, uh, Wi-Fi, there's a Metro Wi-Fi, and the password is Metro 101. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this never gets any easier than getting the PowerPoint from computer to computer. Um, so the first, you know, some background, um, because most of you aren't from California. The, um, there was a passage of a, a California Senate Bill 375 a few years back, which uh, it, it overall was part of California's greenhouse gas reduction plan, um, and that called on larger metro, or sorry, all areas, all cities in the state, to come up with ways to rearrange land use and transportation to reduce greenhouse gases. So not not new engines or fuels or other those industrial processes, but just this specifically an urban planning kind of chunk of how to do this. And that law and some of the related funding measures also promoted the larger metros, the four big biggest cities in the state, um, should were, were supposed to upgrade their transportation and land use modeling systems. And there was actually some cash behind that too, which in California is pretty rare these days. So there was a, a call for us to, to revisit how we were looking at, at modeling transportation and land use. And so MTC took this on by building an activity-based travel model, which Dave Ori is in charge of. Uh, very nicely done, very smooth process, uh, wonderful results, uh, a lot of time uh, to do it. Uh, not a lot of time, but a fair amount of time. Uh, ABAG also decided to replace its model for doing land use, which was from the early 1980s. It was pretty sophisticated in the 80s, uh, but it generally ran in Fortran, and it uh, didn't use much data uh, used to you know, assume that there was almost no information about the city, et cetera, et cetera. So we went through a process with Paul and his team at Berkeley, which was painful and fast, but they very impressive. A lot of work got done very quickly. I think you know, rapid, agile construction of a land use modeling system for a metropolitan region on a very tight schedule. But um, I'm not going to tell you, know, didn't, I also didn't really realize this until I finished putting this together. Most of what I'm talking about is, is a little soft for this audience. Uh, it's the problems outside the model. Um, and that's, uh, you know, kind of why we got on such a bad schedule, why things got slowed down. Um, so it's context, um, but there's some stuff about how to talk about the model, output. So the Bay Area Urban Sim model, it's a parcel level model covering the nine counties in the Bay Area. It has, it makes use of um, the, the uh, Urban Sim's new real estate model, which is You'll see a little more detail. It's uses, uh, it puts the process a lot closer to how a developer actually thinks about it. It uses pro formas and simulates very closely a uh, developer's decision-making process. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked with Professor Waddell and his team at UC Berkeley, who's uh, very lucky, I think, that I came here and you know, found a kind of a messy process, but was uh, but came here about the time Paul came to the Bay Area. So I was lucky in that, in that sense that he was very nearby. Um, and then we were able to actually uh, construct a loosely integrated system. The land use and transport models, uh, we send data back between them, but they don't communicate on a you know, regular automated basis. It's a very manual process. But we were able to build a note project, which is probably what I'm most excited about. A pretty interesting projection of what our future would look like without our plan. This is something again, this is EIR language in California, Environmental Impact Report. So the note project is kind of a baseline in some ways, although that's, that word's not recommended. It's a, it's a Future without the project, that's all you're allowed to call it. Um, and four EIR alternatives, different visions of policy packages. The one we wanted to do was our plan, our proposed plan. And then three others that we have to, and that's what the EIR does. It asks us to test other ways of getting at our goals. So we were able to build a modeling system and implement these different alternatives based on policies in a pretty short period of time. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. Under SB 375, the point of a lot of this was we were able also to project greenhouse gases per capita across consistently constructed scenarios. So I jump to the very last slide, um, not on my talk, but on the whole the, the whole process, which is we were able to you know build, uh, run a land use model, get its results into a transportation model, and look at what that did to greenhouse gases generated per capita from driving around 
out to 2035. These are just percentage reductions of our five different alternatives. So not, not too important. But this is the slide, you know, it was pretty exciting to me that we actually got through the whole process and were able to do it. Okay, lessons learned. You know, if something's not clear, just you can interrupt me, but I only have you know, 25 minutes, so we can do a little questions at the end and, and that. Um, here I have some bullets and some. Um, one of the problems is stealing slides, I think, repeatedly from old projects. They have, they're all coded different. Um, institutional, it was a very tight timeline for a very long project. Um, I think that some of the things we did right, these are things we did right or learned to do right by the end. Um, so we divided it into steps to show progress. It was very important, kind of like uh, the executives and uh, even just my, my boss right, right above me. Um, and be clear from the beginning what the production model will or won't have. Uh, because there's kind of, um, in the beginning there wasn't a whole lot of uh, interest maybe in, in what, what it could produce, the model. Then people started to see results and they, some people started to find them very interesting and then ask for more results and more refined results and more policies and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It kind of snowballed into a, something that would have been very cool over an eight year period or something instead of two years. Um, so it's you know, to be very clear that yes, we could work on that in the future, but that's not going to be available for this project. It's kind of a timeline of what's, what's going to be done. <clears throat> we experienced expected resistance to a new tool. This is what I, I thought when I took the job was you know, what I read in planning school was that um, uh, you know, people are worried about uh, highly quantitative, you know, black box um, change to something different, different way of doing things. And think about providing clear, customized descriptions repeatedly, meaning uh, descriptions of how it worked that were tuned for particular audiences. That really helped to help them understand how the model worked. And audiences ranging from other modelers who wanted only cared about calibration and validation of the model to um, executives here who cared about the timeline, um, getting making sure things were done, the legal legal staff making sure it was supportable and consistent, and politicians who um, care about you know, seemingly random things, I think, every week, but uh, you know, there's whatever their constituents are most angry about is probably, you know, makes sense to them, but uh, very unpredictable. Um, I, and then uh, <clears throat> a lot of it also, as people got more interested, there was questions on um, can it do this, or why can't I represent this? Um, why, why aren't there school district quality, why isn't school district quality in the model? And it was Instead of just kind of getting frustrated and saying, oh, there's, you know, there's already too much or there's, that doesn't make sense, explaining very carefully why that didn't make, make sense or providing a, a long-term pathway to, to help them build that information into the model, um, but probably not before you know, the, the immediate deadlines. Um, and then finally, unexpected resistance to a new tool. Um, there was a lot of uh, kind of within the agency threats, you know, the feeling of being threatened by change or a new tool or objective uh, uh, modeling. Um, and so I think that the way we got around that to some extent was broad, persistent repetition of the model strengths. So that was talking to many different external audiences. Uh, you know, we, we, the model got found champions, I think, outside of the agency in terms of some members of the public, few politicians perhaps, other people in other agencies. So people understood it, liked it, wanted to see it go on, even though kind of at the core there was a lot of uh, fight, uh, fighting about whether or not it was a good approach. Um, so lessons learned, LL's lessons learned. The database, um, you know, instead of trying to, to make the data perfect, just assume, you know, or that there's going to be some one really good data set that you can kind of tear off of, all data sources have errors, even the really good ones you pay a lot of money for. Um, Expect to use multiple data sources. So even if you buy a good one, you're going to still want to use other control control data sets. Um, assume imputation will be necessary. This is kind of like there's no data set that's actually good enough to use just out of the box. Um, and that you know I kind of I knew it was going to be difficult, but it was it was harder than I expected. Um, and uh, oops, this is you can see that I copied the slide and didn't remove it all. Um, so forget the last the last bullet here. Uh, Quality is closely uh, uh, correlated to viewing resolution. So, yeah, this the slide up. Sorry, that's why I should not work on an iPad. Um, I think I can see, see clearly. Um, but that that part is the last part of this slide. Quality is closely correlated to viewing resolution. That you know, with the especially with the move toward the partial based or the grid cell based 
models. Um, you produce very refined output. You have very refined input data sets. And you know, there's a tendency to show those, sometimes to make it clear how it works, uh, sometimes because you didn't have time to summarize it. But you, know, you, uh, you really got to think about when you show this high resolution data. Because often, I think the, the data was good enough to work at a zonal level, 1,500 zones for the Bay Area, but not good enough to show at the parcel level. People always can find mistakes or problems. I think a lot of those mistakes washed out at the zones. But you have to be very thoughtful about pres presenting information at that lower, at that higher level of resolution. Oops. Um, I didn't even mean to have my animation, but I copied it over. Um, so, and this gets a little bit no more into the, you know, still this is pretty soft. This is model functioning, but this is mostly how to talk about model functioning, um, how the model runs, which is what I ended up doing, you know, a lot more than I expected when I took the job. Um, is talking to, again, politicians, executive directors, that kind of thing. Uh, so repeated examples of micro simulation, that the model is run as, as a long, long list of agents making choices about where to live and where to locate a business. And these are, these are the stick figures that I stole from David Ory and uh, added, I think I added the, um, the businesswoman with the chart there. And that uh, took me, that probably took me, you know, three days to draw that, but uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, you know, so these little figures are making choices, um, but the um, I think that really helped in terms of like some of the opposition is still kind of um, you know probably rightfully so. You know, they think modeling, they think uh, you know, kind of uh, optimization processes, optimization engines, what I call it here, I guess. Um, you know, they think of models from the '50s that this is we're trying to you know think about one optimal choice for all residents, and. And I don't think necessarily that that stuff that works that way in the 50s necessarily you know, requires that kind of mindset. Or, but I think that the, the use of microsimulation with different um, subgroups, different industries, different subpopulations um, that make different types of choices does really kind of answer that, that fear to some degree. It makes people um, think that there, you know, there is a but it represents the diversity of the population, both the economy and the, the demographic population. In the area, and I think that related very well to the audience. The choices, um, the uh, uh, discrete choice type of framework that Urban Sim is based in makes a lot of sense to people. And we talked about it in a minute, the real estate models kind of move toward that as well. It's choices that uh, they can imagine making or are one degree removed, but they're not some really abstract input output type relationship or gravity relationship. It's, uh, it's all about decision making that is similar to what they've done in their own lives. Um, and then here's one that uh, uh, the process we went through was kind of because the model came in kind of late and there was kind of two different organizational views on how to do this, uh, we ended up coming up with a bunch of alternatives that were built off of model, outside the modeling system, static future visions <laughs> of what 2040 should look like in terms of its spatial distribution of population and household, sorry, households and businesses. Um, and then we brought in a modeling system that we wanted to use to create alternatives, but also to represent, you know, we wanted to use, we used the model to build some of these static futures. We tried to train the model to reproduce a static vision of the future. And I think that um, we tried to automate that, but we're not successful. Uh, so we ended up kind of having to kind of pull different policy levers in the model in order to come up with an outcome that was predetermined in 2040. I don't know if I'm making that pretty clear, but it's, it's, I think that, you know, it's frustrating, but I think it's very common. I think it's going to stay common as well, even if we were, you know, our staff was a little more used to the model. Um, I think that that planning tends to um, think in visions of 2040. Well, I know that planning tends to think in visions of the out year, and it's very hard to get over that. Maybe that's just a natural way of thinking 2040 is going to look like this, and for 30 years, maybe longer, there's been a critique of planning that, uh, you can't stop there and just say, oh, this is the vision. You have to talk about how you're going to get there. And so I think by bringing in the model behind that and reproducing it, it was very useful to think about how policies might reproduce that future. But it was very difficult. So there's kind of institutional things about how to bridge that gap, but also some of the technical problems like getting the, um, automating the process to some degree to come up with a, drive the model toward a predetermined outcome. Um, and then the pro forma is the part of the new real estate model. And uh, how many of you don't know what a pro forma is? Uh oh, uh, so a pro forma is a uh, a, you know, a spreadsheet, and 
probably existed before spreadsheets, but uh, it's, a, it's a quick way for a, a real estate developer to look at a potential project and kind of sketch out the details of how much it's going to cost to build and how much money is going to come in over time and come up with an idea, is it worth building this project right now? And will I make a profit? <coughs> so the new real estate model actually zooms in and looks at individual parcels. And this was really, really great, I thought, because um, it's it should be a theoretical advance, it's a, you know, closer to the way it's done in the real world. But again, for, for me, having to explain it to people, um, there is a fair number of there are a fair number of planners that have training in that kind of real estate economics thinking. Um, they know what pro forma is, and it's easy to break down the component pieces. So I have a quick example, which Paul's probably seen twenty times. But uh, so this is uh, finally a map. Um, it's uh, so this is an example. This is the very rich data set we were able to actually build over time of the amount of stuff in anyone. Oh, it says can't test you. Um, Central San Jose, and so the deeper the color, the more the taller the building is, the more stuff, the more square footage there is on the site. And yellow and orange are residential, blue is jobs. That's kind of a, the general take on it. So you can see the incredible amount of resolution to the data and the parcel approach. And um, I've also sketched into two uh, new BART stations, and they're kind of easy walking distance uh, that we're planning to build in the region. And so I was able to give this example, I think pretty effectively, zooming into a particular parcel. And this is what the new real estate uh, algorithm does. But again, I found it, you know, in, in, it's a little tricky because you don't want to, you don't want to look too much at any one given parcel or, you know, little piece of data. But by doing this example, which was somewhat um, smoothed out and um, I made sure one that, you know, I had one that made sense. Um, I was able to kind of explain how the model worked to people that didn't that didn't know what what the, it was doing. It, you know, kind of un I don't have a metaphor um, un unopaque the black box of the modeling, you know, clear it off a little bit, and uh, so zooms in and uh, it takes some information from the the, the base year geo database. Um, how big is the parcel? What is its zoning? Um, Jason and some of my other colleagues here, Jason Bunkers, um, collect zoning for the entire. Bay Area, which was 109 jurisdictions, um, that was pretty intense. But once you have that, it's incredibly valuable uh, for what we're trying to do. Obviously, um, we, we the model model goes in and fixed how big is it? What is it zoned for? What types of things could a developer build here? What's allowed? <coughs> but other data for the pro forma, this kind of you know, this this list of how am I going to make can I make money? This fake developer on this site is dynamically supplied by Urban Sim. This work is pretty interesting. So you go out into the future and it comes up with values for what are how big are other units nearby if I were going to build this. And if you tend to build similar size units in the area, what is the market, the nearby market like? Um, but more most importantly, which is probably left oh there the values. What is the price? What is what are units, condos in this case, going for nearby? In, in this year of simulation. So 2010, we can kind of just look that up in the newspaper, but when we get out to 2020, 2030, Urban Sim provides this representation of what are what is the going price for a new condo in this area. And that obviously is pretty essential for what the developer can or can't do on that site. Um, so what I did, again, my other colleague, I don't see Dave, Dave Botton. I don't know if he's here yet. He's, he has a lot of a heavy workload, but he created these pretty incredible slides of a chalkboard um, for our executive director, I believe. Let's just make sure he got the math. But um, again, no, you know, I'm just kind of going through this, this quick. So if you really want to know how to perform, I can talk later how it works. But it's basically, what can I sell it for? How much does it cost to buy the site, tear down the building that's there, build the building, um, fees that the city takes. And um, what this does is, is show um, Currently, in the base condition, this is a little little different here. This is showing four potential situations, and they kind of build up on each other. Um, so the current situation, it's a quick calculation, and just kind of uh, in chalk, a representative example of what the model is doing thousands of times, going through, figuring out what I can sell condos for, what it costs to build them, and then adding different changes that we could ex that we expect or could expect to happen in the future. Addition of the new train stations drives it drives up you know affects values on both sides of the uh, you know the, the 
the equation, costs and profits, or uh, costs and uh, revenues, sorry. Um, but, you know, it changes, might change the situation. So numbers change, we have the train stations, changes the, the, out, the developer's view on this. But in the first two cases, currently, and with the train, in this example, which don't, don't take too much out of it, the developer in the model <coughs> decides not to build. Can't make a profit. We had something called streamlining, which was part of SB 375, that we may, if we did our EIR well, that local projects can tier their EIR, their studies and environmental impacts for projects off of ours. So the, the, the approvals process is shorter and cheaper. Time is money. And in this case, the streamlining, is, we, didn't, we didn't represent it as a very large effect in the model, but in this case, it bumps it just over the top. The developer now decides to build 45 units in profit. And if we add an urban growth boundary, that changes the land market conditions. And in that case, the developer makes a different calculation, and 56 units in retail makes sense. So, and that's kind of what, you know, our vision of what we'd like to see there is maybe over, way on the right. And the model helped us to, to very carefully connect these potential policies to how can we get to that, what we'd like to see, that vision in the future. And then also, again, to me, I could explain how it was happening somebody that doesn't do a lot of modeling. Um, okay, so we don't have too many more. Um, so output, um, it was uh, very useful to put the output, out model outputs comes out with parcel-based um, uh, new buildings, locations of households and, and firms. That's a lot of, a lot of data. But um, we uh, ended up, we started showing some maps of like even 1,500 zones of change and that's really complicated because you know what do you what do you, how do you think your region is going to change over the next 30 years at the zonal level? We found the audience kept getting again public uh, higher level decision makers in our own agencies kept getting distracted by like these details. Some of them probably due to data errors or problems um, that might wash it out at different levels. Some of them just like I don't know. I'd have to look into why that neighborhood changes so much. I don't know all 1,500 zones perfectly. And so putting them into larger zones or you know things that people could grab onto outside of modeling really helped. Um, the use of parcels allows easy summarization into any zone system, which is pretty powerful. I'll show an example in a sec. And um, eventually we also realized that the addition of historical data really helps you to understand, um, is what I'm predicting reasonable? Like you're saying, oh, I can do the next 30 years. What happened in the last 30 years? It's very helpful to show that so people get a context. And probably should have put this in order, but yeah. Over, I think I've mentioned this a few times already, but being able to present these results at all levels of technical skill. So, an example, these are, we use these as zones, the big three cities in our region, and we, we summarized all the data into these very core zones, even though we were using very detailed micro simulation. And, again, I'm not going to go into all the detail on this unless we want to talk later, but um, this just shows in the first column of 2010, the share of households and then jobs in each part of the pie in those four zones, which, you know, offhand, when I started this, I wouldn't have known that offhand. You know, I would have been, oh, I can kind of guess. I think I know this stuff pretty well from the Bay Area. But um, we calculated it, and then we, uh, you know, saw, you know, some of them in green were increasing the share. It's a little confusing because the absolute number of, of households and jobs goes up in all four areas over the 30 years in this, in this alternative. But, or these, these alternatives, sorry. Um, but the share way seemed to be a pretty useful way of thinking about it. You know, where's the, the population or job center kind of shifting to? It also made it look kind of, uh, you know, it helped you compare alternatives off of each other, think about what they're trying, you know, what they end up achieving. That was pretty, pretty powerful. Um, this is always a confusing map. We had a variety of different, those were big, you know, macro regional zones. We had a bunch of, we had two different main types of, Micro zones, priority development areas, PDAs, and transportation priority project areas, TPPs. And uh, um, they have some degree of overlap. But let's just say they are areas that are um, <clears throat> small and near good transit is the idea. And so again, same type of comparison. How much? You know, what is the outcome in the out year for these different? You know, where where are we shifting households? Are we getting? You know, we in general, if we want to decrease GHGs, we probably want to shift more of the households toward the center of the region, most likely. It's some debate. 
but we want to definitely, almost definitely shift more households and jobs closer to transit. And so this kind of, we were able to summarize these parcels in any way we wanted, come up with some pretty intuitive ways to understand it, I think. Um, this is a, a PDF from the NICE model output system that Paul's team was able to build us, I think in R. Um, it had uh, processed our results, and this one is nice because it, we, after a while, realized it would be cool to, we originally were beginning it in the very middle, where it says year 2010, our base year, but we could just statically put in, uh, this is, sorry, county of employment, total uh, count, uh, employment by county. Uh, what did that look, what did the change look like historically? And this is not the greatest example because of two major downturns in the economy, so it's not, you know, it's not a straight line, but it might be too boring you know, if it was just a straight line, but um, you see the downturn, but you know, so the rate of growth now, how does it compare to that historical rate of growth? How, how steep are the lines? Mm -hmm. uh, so, policy levers of participation, I think that was, um, we ended up building a lot of different policy input mechanisms, and I think that was very powerful. It kind of seems overdone almost. We kind of did a lot of different ways of doing this. I think that was very useful for getting, uh, you know, community groups interested. They, they all, they kind of everyone had their kind of pet ideas of how they wanted to approach things. So it's, it was, I think we made a lot of progress in getting a lot of realism into the model system. And that, that got us a lot of buy-in from people. This, this wasn't some theoretical model that we could kind of just do something that didn't have much to do with real policy, but we could represent policies in a reasonable way. So these are our five alternatives. We'll go a little quicker. And Dave Vaughton again came up with these puzzle pieces. These were policy you know, chunks that could be combined into a puzzle to build an alternative. So it was a very nice ability to craft an alternative, assemble a set of policies to help us achieve a particular outcome. I think that, uh, again, was a very nice way to present it. And we were able to, to model it quite well. A lot of that is, you know, it's the parcel level, real zoning, um, the new real estate model, those things allowed us a lot of flexibility in representing real policies, uh, very close to how they would be done in the real world. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here. It's pretty map though. Um, so one thing that toward the end also we noticed, um, I needed another map, um, is that uh, we, we built five alternatives, no project, four other alternatives, but we, uh, and most of them, you know, it's very spatial, I think most of you know that. Um, we applied zoning changes and fee structures, subsidies, um, the uh, particular uh, you know, the tiering, which is a, a way of decreasing the, the development approvals time, to particular areas in each alternative, but not until the very end when I had to make a map do we really compare what zones were we focused on in the different alternatives. This was actually pretty useful, but it's probably the last map I made in the whole thing, which was, um, and it's a little, it's probably a little hard to read, but um, the red is just where all four of the non, you know, there's the no project, which is kind of like it is now. The red is all four of the other alternatives are trying to increase growth in that, in that lo those locations. So there's a lot of overlap in all the alternatives that were generated by different groups and different goals, etc. The other ones kind of show different overlaps between where we were focusing our efforts. And again, that's, this is maps so interesting to look at in regards to, to major transit systems, that type of thing. Um, what were we trying to do? But we didn't really do it to the very end. Um, three more slides. Um, so next steps, fundamental improvements. These probably show up on everyone's everyone's thing. Um, we, we move very fast. We had a lot of data quality problems. We think we're going to get a lot more data. Data is going to increase in speed. So I think a lot of our repetition rate, new new data sets. So I think we uh, we need to think of ways to kind of automate the data integration process, get more stuff in there, understand what we're imputing, um, and uh, the travel model is moving to a higher resolution um, shortly. 50,000 zones. I think there's going to be a lot of, um, you think about, you know, are we confident with the, you know, how much retail we're putting into each of those zones? It's very much about pedestrian mobility. Um, you know, kind of thinking is the model producing real reasonable results at that high resolution. More policy levers. Um, I think, you know, the fundamentals are very important, but the audience really wants to represent a bunch of these other things that are um, 
often kind of variants, we think more and more is there a way to get a generic toolbox like that we can build policies quicker, because they're often just kind of variants of each other. In conclusion, um, the overall experience is very difficult to undertaking, a lot harder than I had bargained on. I couldn't find the right word here. The wasn't quite politics. The politics were hard, but the uh, internal strife about how to approach this stuff was very uh, challenging. Um, but I think that just the side benefits, and maybe I, didn't, you know, I should have, these are things to, to emphasize early on as well, um, made the whole thing worth it. We have a high resolution base here geodatabase. We know what's, what's where, which we, as a planning agency, we didn't know that very well. We know a lot more about capacity um, and refinements of capacity. There's vacant land, but there's land that's um, in various stages of old, not built up, or brand new buildings. We didn't really know what was anywhere until now. Uh, we're talking out loud about urban economic, the urban economic system and how development works. How are we actually going to get policies to get to these, these outcomes? And we're talking about actual policies instead of just talking about visions or out here, uh, out, outcomes, uh, which I think for planning is one of its, its ongoing struggles. Um, and I think we're just getting to the true model benefits. We're, we're brand new at this. And so I think a lot more of you will have other things to say about you know, the, the nitty gritty of the, the model output. We're very excited about that. That's also and probably maybe one or two questions now, but then uh, more questions at the end. If there's any. All right, thank you. Can we take a couple of questions, Billy? Really? I, I have a million questions. Yeah. But I'll just it to two. <laughs> uh, the first is uh, um, it, you said that there was a, there seemed to be like a pre existing future alternative that stakeholders had in their mind that had sort of Started with that endpoint and worked backwards. Were the puzzle pieces and those policies you described were those the things you used to try to like? How did you get to that pre-existing future? Or so, is it so for the proposed plan, yeah, it's it's the way things work around here is that you know there's a it's kind of a give and take between the regional agency and the local jurisdictions, kind of saying you know we want more growth in these places near transit. Some jurisdictions say no. Some say, okay, we want this much. So there's this very political, politicized process of agreeing on how much can go places. And then sometimes the agency says, oh, you're going to get a little bit more because the total doesn't fit anywhere. Um, and that's a very ad hoc, what, you know, where will, where will everything fit in 2040? Um, and those numbers get kind of into the political process. Um, how well those decide they can't take more than X number of units by 2040. And that's become a... Um, I can't think of the right metaphor, a, a touch point, a, um, it's important. And the, so there's that, so there's a pretty, a very detailed static end year distribution of especially housing units, jobs a little less so, but housing units. And then there's some vague ideas of policies, uh, which are the kind of precursors to the, um, the uh, puzzle pieces. And those are, those is what came out of the planning process. And then the, the puzzle pieces were, we inter, you know, talk to the planning staff about their, their kind of big ideas about policy and, and how to turn those into you know, what a model needs, which is very precise. So if we're going to charge a fee, how much is it going to be uh, in these places? And what's the, the steepness? If we're going to charge fees in the suburbs and you know, high DMT locations, and how steep is that? What, where do we, you know, where do we how, how much compactness are we really aiming for? And so we kind of work with them, came up with more um, you know, real policies that could, you know, could actually put, in, put into a model system, ran the model, and tried to reproduce their static snapshot of 2040, and then adjust it. And it was repeat, 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 um, until we could get pretty close to their static 2040. So it's a, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that, that, uh, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, and then related to this, uh, having used to live here in the area, I know that ABAC also produces uh, the land use Projections, this product called projections, that's nine, from eleven, from thirteen. Uh, is does have you been able to get Urbanson to predict the projections, or is that a separate data the product? And this is just a scenario. <coughs> so projections um, is a. It's going to be prepared. Hing back here, one of my colleagues is in, in charge, I believe, of uh, coming out with projections. And projections this year um, will be. Similar to the proposed, will be exactly the same as the proposed plan, which is that static 2040 vision. And so 
Urban Sim was not used to kind of come up, come up with that. It was that was come up with as a vision, and so it's a future. It's kind of a it's a projection, but it's a projection that involves some politics. And so 20 years ago, I think the projections people would say, "Oh, this is a neutral projection," and it's become a little bit more politicized in the last 10 or 15 years. You know, the um, you know it's it's a projection of what we hope happens to some degree. Um, and you know, my former boss here said you, know, you wouldn't want to just leave out the hope that it, you know we're going to achieve some of these regional goals. So our projection incorporates some of these regional goals. It is from that static, that static uh, political kind of uh, vision. And Urbanson is was I think very usefully used to recreate that to kind of say help us understand how challenging is that going to be. And so in some I think we found some parts not so hard. Some parts. Um, we think, you know, considering what we had to do policy-wise, that maybe we'd say they're a little less likely, or they're going to be harder to achieve. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. So next up, I think we have our colleagues from Detroit, Simcon, Shuan uh, Yu, and uh, is Guan Yu going to join you? Um, I'll do the talking, and the talking. you will answer tough questions. And, okay, so all the tough questions go to Guang Yu. So, very good. So we'll see if the uh, if the issues in politics are uh, just the same in uh, that part of the world, or, uh, or are they really different? Changing every day. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not going to talk on the model. This morning, instead, I'm going to talk about a couple of things in the next uh, 25 minutes. One is a brief uh, review of our history of applying permission to a very complex region, Southeast Michigan, uh, center around Detroit. The other is uh, something we're doing right now after we finished the last forecast a year ago, which is to develop a true region wide building database. Uh, it turns out that it could be just in time for uh, using the new software, the uh, Urban Canvas. Uh, so I think uh, those are the two things I'm going to uh, talk about this morning. A brief uh, uh, overview about the region. It's really uh, the southeast corner of uh, the Michigan. The first one is Wayne County, where Detroit is located. Uh, uh, almost five million people, two and a half million jobs. It's really Half of the uh, population, the jobs of Michigan, actually live or work in this uh, southeast quarter of uh, Michigan. Um, so we have been trying to adapt urban sun model system to this complex region for the last 12 years or so. Uh, we started by developing a pilot urban sun model back in 2001. Because uh, at that time, we were not sure if we have the data, we have the capacity, we have the resources to actually apply a complex system like Herbison to Southeast Michigan. So we took one county and developed this pilot project. Uh, it was a result based model. Uh, basically, we were really trying to test if we can get the data needed for the system. Can we process data? And we actually developed the model and run a couple of scenarios and make sure uh, we can do this at least for a county, and then we can go out to the regional scale. So after that was completed in 2003, we took another four or five years to develop this first real region-wide urban sim model, still result-based. Uh, it was the first time we actually linked urban sim model to our transportation travel demand forecast model, uh, TransCAD. Uh, and it was the first urban sim-based region-wide uh, forecast that was actually adopted by SEMCAG, um, uh, the policy body, and the members of the SEMCAG. The law was finished in 2008, and we're on the four year cycle now for a long range transportation plan. So uh, we took another four years and developed the newest, the, the most recent uh, forecast that's all the way to 2040. Still, of course, region wide, but this time it is uh, parcel based. We play from the grid cell based model. Certainly, more details uh, with the new developer model, as Mike mentioned as well, um, with more uh, refinement in this uh, new forecast, uh, 2040, grid uh, parcel based forecast. Just a quick uh, uh, comparison between the 2035 model we had by 
result in the 2040 model, model we had by parcel. Uh, certainly, there were many more parcels than results. The results are uh, 150 meters square by about five acres. We had half million green cells uh, parcels. We have 1.8 million parcels for the Simon County region. There are more land use types uh, for accommodating different uh, development uh, uh, templates and so forth. Uh, increase from 15 land use types in the old model to 41. Certainly, there are many more building types in the past. Green cell model are not really building types, uh, uh, buildings, really, building types. Just uh, residential, commercial, industrial, and uh, institutional, four different uh, uh, building types in my grid cell. Uh, the new model has uh, 37 uh, different uh, building types. Uh, number of buildings, again, in the mo new old model, those uh, were not real buildings, just uh, grid cells that uh, have buildings for something residential or non residential. We had uh, only a quarter million. Old model, now we have uh, about 1.9 million buildings in, in the new model. Increased job sectors, and now we have the buildings that we the, the person's table, uh, which is uh, which was not in the green cell model. Now we can actually get the person's uh, forecast directly from the model. So, along the way, in the last 12 years, developing the model or adapting the person model to the Sun region, uh, we, we went through. Uh, some uh, exercises we really uh, try to make the model work for this region. You know, each each urban sim application is different, uh, different regions. Uh, for us, uh, we always had uh, what we call the, the sub-regional uh, large area controls. It's it's a complex region with seven very different counties. We have central counties, central cities, older cities declining at the same time. We have uh, growing. Uh, Fast growing um, suburbs and, and uh, newer counties and newer uh, cities, newer places. Um, we do run the model as a region, as a regional model, but uh, we think we need to uh, recognize the uniqueness of these different places, different counties, and city of Detroit. So we always try to get the data and the model uh, to fit uh, different parts of the region as much as we can. Uh, so we start with some sub-regional large area can, large area controls. Uh, the the population and employment controls are really from the Remy model. We have Remy numbers by county, and this time we've actually separated the uh, city of Detroit out. We have eight large areas, sub-regional areas, and we develop uh, control those from those large different uh, unique areas. And uh, it also has potential to uh, have. Uh, uh, different sets of models or unique uh, controls or uh, input for those uh, large areas as well. Although the model still runs as, as a regional model, for example, accessibility, uh, you certainly know where the jobs are in different counties as region wide. Um, we have our own house of synthesizers, which we think uh, that uses the uh, census data more effectively. We always try to get the best. A piece of census data, for example, we try to use 100% count data first uh, before we go to the sample data. We also think we have uh, uh, a good uh, allocation uh, process by uh, using the household attributes such as income and the uh, building uh, characteristics like the prices of the building, try to uh, allocate the census size household to the right locations uh, within uh, the, the zone. Uh, we added some uh, features that uh, are really needed for our region. Uh, we have a demolition piece, we have a development event piece, and these are really needed for uh, some of our older communities that uh, are actually uh, losing jobs and losing population. You can see uh, abandoned buildings need to be uh, demolished. Um, the the results, the, the adopted forecast is not really direct, uh, just raw output from the model in run. It's not a, just a pure technical process. Uh, it's also a negotiation and uh, uh, communication process. We produce the, the, the forecast from the model runs, and then we have discussions with uh, 
our staff, those consultants, elected officials, local planners, and review the forecast. And sometimes we do believe uh, some changes are needed. Uh, therefore, we try to um, uh, incorporate in the process of some adjustment to the initial model output uh, to the system. Uh, so we have some uh, additional uh, features of our models, adding so-called traction factors. And this could be based on the historical trend of uh, uh, place, city, village, object. It could be based on uh, other factors that uh, came out from the uh, discussions we had with uh, uh, locals. A couple of things uh, we have been uh, working on uh, as well. One of them is uh, when we moved from the uh, grid cell based model to the parcel based model, one disadvantage of the time was uh, was uh, uh, it became more difficult to uh, calculate local accessibility, uh, which we think uh, very important for us to estimate uh, location choice for households and uh, businesses. So um, uh, this is primarily what we uh, was trying to combine some of the features in the cell based model uh, with the parcel based model by uh, calculating local accessibility. Uh, uh, Pretty much based on the old uh, uh, self based uh, model. Uh, I was, uh, we were so glad to hear that uh, Professor Waddell's team developed some new uh, procedures for uh, calculating accessibility, and really uh, looking forward to listening to uh, more about that uh, at this conference. Um, other post processing uh, refinements uh, features we're adding really for uh, you know, making the adjustments after the model runs to meet the. Uh, the review process. Just uh, a couple of slides of uh, some of our uh, output from different uh, uh, runs. This one is uh, testing some land use policies, uh, basically uh, through zoning, whether uh, you allow higher density or not, uh, based on some ratios of value, uh, lands and uh, buildings and things, uh, so on and so forth. And, and you see some uh, uh, differences when you have different policies. In terms of the future uh, land development, uh, Mike mentioned that uh, it's, it's a really uh, advantage of having the parcel based model uh, that you can aggregate the parcel output to other geographies. It's just not a small, uh, not the small advantage. It's actually a very, very convenient. Uh, we can aggregate parcel based output to transit analysis, low traffic analysis zones, uh, cities, related townships. We are a uh, local home rule state. We have 233 uh, cities with townships. Uh, it's it's um, very convenient to aggregate parcel based off of to these communities. And this slide shows the uh, forecast 2020 2035 household change by community. Uh, you can see uh, that's Detroit and some other uh, suburbs declining uh, at the same time. We have some newer suburban uh, communities. Actually, uh, forecast will grow uh, significantly as the uh, uniqueness of the region, one of the uh, characteristics of the region. Um, so, I'm going to switch to the uh, next topic, which is uh, building a, a two region wise uh, 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 building database. Uh, I talked about we have uh, buildings and building types, but we never really had a region wide two building database. I'm curious, how many regions have a real uh, building style? That's, that's great. Great. Um, so when we finished the last forecast about a year ago, uh, we are in this process of uh, reviewing the model and also review uh, the data. And uh, it was a unique um, uh, opportunity because uh, uh, we had uh, some funding available through the Art uh, Sustainability Grant that we can acquire some new data. Um, so one thing uh, we did, still working on it, uh, is uh, getting a new uh, region-wide land cover and uh, building footprint database. So um, that's that's that could be a real benefit for the next uh, urbanism model, also for using some new features of urbanism and urban canvas. Uh, and also can be used for many other uh, planning activities, uh, and some uh, region-wide planning activities, or by the local communities. 
So building footprints, we started by uh, hiring a consultant to do the building footprints. Footprints is really a, a protected area from the roof down, so they're not real building footprints. It's really they, uh, the outline of the, of the building. And our uh, <coughs> model is, our, our data is really based on the 2010 era photography. Um, the consultant delivered 2.6 million ground buildings for us late last year. And uh, we're doing some additional processing uh, of the database for uh, community by community, or city by city. Um, we're doing this, again, uh, really not just for the uh, modeling purposes, but also for a lot of uh, planning activities. So, yeah, and that makes the uh, project more attractive to um, the management of the, uh, the board. Um, basically, there are two ways to do the building footprints. One is image processing. The other way is digitizing. There are uh, benefits and disadvantages. Both of them require good uh, auto photography. Uh, image processing is probably faster but less accurate. The digitizing is certainly slower, involves some manual work, uh, could be more accurate. Um, but both need some post editing. That's uh, something I'm going to talk about a little bit more next. Uh, the cost is actually uh, similar for a region like us. Uh, it was about $150,000 this time. So we actually choose the digitized uh, method to creating the buildings. Uh, we use LIDAR data to get the, the heights of each building, really the median height. Because um, we saw the digitized uh, method is more accurate, and uh, we're not in RA hurry to uh, use the data. We have some time uh, for uh, the vendor to deliver the footprints. Um, this is an uh, example of one of the uh, this is actually Bell L in Detroit River. This is what the vendor developed originally. Um, we had to do, even, even though that was digitized, we still have to uh, really uh, do some quality control and make sure uh, the uh, buildings are actually buildings. We have um, part-time staff working on this. Look at the uh, area, block by block, and remove those not true buildings first. Um, you know, the additional work, once we get the, the, the delivery of well, the consultants and building, we delete these non-building footprints, cardboard, picnic shelters, and then um, we assign additional attributes uh, to these buildings, such as building type, um, need to correct some very obvious errors, delineation. Uh, sometimes we need to divide footprint into uh, parts because these are really separate buildings. Um, assigning housing unit counts, storage, uh, apartment buildings, condominiums. Um, and again, we're uh, visually verify uh, building information for residential building and non-residential building. The, the data we get back from the consultant really just have two attributes. Uh, one is ID of the building, the other is median height of the building. Um, certainly, to use that uh, database for modeling and for other purposes, we need to add attributes to it. We're assigning uh, additional 15 attributes right now to these buildings. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we have a pretty good parcel database uh, we use for the last forecast. We're joining the parcel database with these buildings and transfer data from the parcel file to uh, the buildings and also using other sources to correct, to make the building uh, database more accurate uh, with more information. And these are just some uh, examples of uh, the new attributes we're adding to it, from the values to square feet to size to the gear build, uh, mostly from assessing data again. So one of the things we are adding to these buildings is the uh, building types, uh, which is very one of the first things uh, needed for uh, analysis and forecasting. And these are just some examples of those uh, 62 type of uh, building types, office buildings, residential buildings, of different types. And this is only not a complete list. Uh, so as you can see, just by adding that one attribute with the building types, uh, 
get more information about these buildings. This shows the uh, different uh, building types, different colors. Um, there, there are many more applications than just using them in the uh, forecast. Um, one of them is actually getting the uh, very good, accurate count of housing units. Uh, could be more accurate than census. Um, just take a look at this one. This is the uh, um, part of the city of Detroit. We got those buildings. We actually added the housing unit counts to the buildings. And this is not just from the parcel file, it's also from a building survey that uh, 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 the region did uh, a couple of years ago. And, and notice that there are a couple of large buildings in that area, that part of Detroit, actually we assigned zero housing unit to them, even though buildings still, still exist, but we really don't think those buildings are still inhabitable, uh, even though they're accounted in the census. Uh, but I think we're doing this to get a more realistic, uh, more accurate housing count for uh, the region. So this is just a comparison of the number of units from three different sources, a different type of housing in total. Uh, you can see the decennial census at uh, 9,800 um, residential buildings in that area. Decennial census doesn't give you any uh, data about the type of housing. <coughs> ACS does have that slightly slower number than that. This is July, this is April. Uh, but once we went through this building database uh, uh, process, um, we think um, we have a much better uh, handle on the real uh, available inhabitable housing units in that area, which is actually smaller than the central census, smaller than the ACS. And uh, for this particular area, uh, we have, uh, I don't think we have any manufactured housing, even though ACS says that. At the same time, uh, the single family housing actually also much fewer than the ACS data showed, uh, so on and so forth. And this actually has a uh, pretty significant implication for using urban sim as well, particularly when you do the household location choice model. So if, if we just use 2010 census, this is what the census uh, told us. Uh, for that area, uh, occupied units, 7,300. Vacant units, 2,400. And census really doesn't give you the uninhabitable uh, housing units, so it gives you the vacancy rate of 75%. So 25% of the houses are vacant, and if you use that for urban sim, urban sim will think, okay, there are 25% vacant units there, and we'll try to allocate a household to those uh, housing units first. But once we went through this process, we actually identified um, 1,100 housing units that are actually all you have to go. And we took them out of the system. Uh, the vacancy rate, vacancy rate is only 18%. Um, so it's not just having a better database, it's also really have implications for future uh, modeling work. Of course, you know, with the building database, you can do uh, market analysis, look at who's there, who's missing, uh, so uh, new development. Just want to show some uh, visualization of uh, part of the uh, city of Detroit. This is a university uh, region, Wayne State University. Um, again, different colors, different building types. And um, um, this is um, just taking the building footprints and using arc scene and X2 uh, by height uh, with the uh, uh, building types. Uh, in different colors. Um, it's actually a pretty uh, simple process to generate a 3D image like this. Um, and uh, you can improve that by adding some more realistic buildings. Uh, oops, again. Um, so this one. Now, these are the Arxene extruded buildings. Uh, these are the uh, Google SketchUp uh, buildings. We didn't we didn't make any of these ourselves. It's just amazing how many, how many people out there are actually building this little building stuff just uh, uh, for fun. So you can actually search these buildings, just borrow them, steal them, and put them in the system. 
uh, give you a more uh, realistic um, uh, view. Uh, so the course you can do. Uh, I'm not going to do a this video. It's just uh, street level animation. Uh, of course, you can add more uh, facade details. And it's really good for code work. Uh, actually, one of the first applications using this database. It's not for urban sim. So we're not going to uh, produce a forecast in three or four years. This is actually using the database for code analysis. And people realize how valuable the data is. Um, so, so far we have about a million, I think just uh, fewer than a million uh, buildings post process. Uh, we're actually delivering the results to uh, cities within towns of communities. And as I mentioned, we're already used by some uh, regional and local planning projects. We want to finish the uh, building uh, footprints by the uh, end of this year. We're developing strategies of uh, updating the database in the future. Uh, of course, uh, we're looking forward to use uh, uh, building database in the next forecast. And actually, um, uh, we gave a, a small sample of the building uh, footprint to Professor Waddell's team, and, and uh, Connor showed us what uh, urban canvas can do with uh, uh, buildings. Really uh, look forward to uh, future use of that. Um, that's it. Uh, now, Guang Yu can ask questions. Thank you. Are there some questions? Mark, don't ask tough questions. Well, no, this one's easy. I'm fixing the room total of 60 interns all looking through 2.6 million building footprint files. How are you seeing this? You indicated almost going screen by screen and checking this. How much time has this taken so far and what's the projection? We only have three part time hours and an intern. We only have 60. Um, but we also. 24 hour shifts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but we also are doing something uh, 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 more innovative that, uh, for example, I, I'm going to take my community uh, and I look at that community. Uh, by myself. Um, so we have staff for familiar with different areas. When they have some time, uh, they work, work out in the area. Uh, we also hope uh, the local <laughs> communities can help. Uh, so far, I don't think we have anybody really working on it, but uh, we're, we're really communicating uh, with local planners. We do presentations, tell them what we have, and see if you can at least help us to maintain it in the future. Um, so it's, it's, it's a combination of different uh, sources of resources I'm trying to do this. And we have time. We're not, we don't have a really hard deadline to do this. We finished last forecast a year ago, and I don't know exactly when we're going to do the next forecast, at least not in uh, three years. Um, so let's, let's go over it. Mitri. How do you deal with uh, mixed-use type of buildings where you have retail and office or apartments and retail? How do you account for different types of square footage? Um, if, if there's a um, really dominating type, we just uh, ignore all the other things. Uh, for for more evenly split things, or even for uh, you know, many of the apartment buildings, it looks like one building, but actually they're, they're separate, or at least different uh, units. So we're creating a separate layer. Uh, that actually uh, stores that information. We can have, we can have, we can have uh, two points for a uh, condominium building representing different units. Uh, you can have um, um, actually a combination of different uh, building types uh, for for a, a block. Uh, so uh, we're splitting some, uh, but we're also trying to store some additional information to separate. Uh, Inferring the number of floors and therefore the number of actual floor space doesn't necessarily mean there's not always the same values for each each floor. Did like, you address that? It's, it's an estimation. I don't think we can actually address it. Especially in mixed use programs where you may yes. have the buyers. Yes. It's a good question. Uh, but I don't think we're really that accurate for either. All right, so I think we're uh, going to take a short break now, and then we'll come back and hear from um, 
Next up will be the Puget Sound Regional Council. So, Mark, good thing you didn't ask too hard a question, or you might have to tell you back to you.
Evening, and any of you that are interested in coming to that for more socializing uh, are welcome to come. There's information about how to get there on transit uh, on the website, the registration page, and uh, we'll have various plats that can help guide you through the transit system to, uh, to get there this afternoon. So, um, with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Mark Simonson at the Puget Sound Regional Council and uh, ask him to walk us through their experiences in the Puget Sound. Uh, I still miss the rain in Seattle, believe it or not. Uh, I had a great time there for 13 years and had a great long standing collaboration with the uh, Puget Sound Regional Council. And, um, now I'm eager to hear what's been happening with the market. Yeah, we've heard that moment has been we lost the home court advantage uh, in <laughs> San Francisco. Good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, Mark Simonson again. I've been with PSRC since 2000. Um, Principal Planner in the Data Systems Analysis Department. And also here is Billy Charlie, and he's our new Program Manager at Safe Division. Uh, he just joined us today, and I believe April is working on this work. There you go, thanks. So uh, interject uh, where you see appropriately. Um, the war stories I'm going to share are going to sound awful familiar to the ones you've already heard. We've gone down some very similar paths, also some, hopefully some different uh, uh, unique twists on what we encounter in terms of Using Urban Sim for our very first forecast. Um, as far as I know, this is my YouTube debut. So <laughs> I'm going to congratulations and counts. Um, here's my outline. I've got some context slides at the very beginning. And I think the three or four points I'm going to hit in particular, I'm going to talk about our work in uh, getting Urban Sim to ready to use stats. And that's not just from a technical standpoint. That was from the outreach standpoint as well. And some of the work that in particular, um, pre-acknowledging some folks that aren't here today, Matt Kitchen, Craig Hellman, uh, two folks who recently left the SRC that were our program managers, and uh, Mike Jensen as well, in terms of working on the validation and the, uh, the heavy lifting, so to speak, on the urban uh, employment side. The modeling land development behavior is a preview slide. I saved the technical details for tomorrow, uh, but I just wanted to kind of set the stage for what our biggest challenges were that we encountered in terms of getting the output stable enough to raise the confidence level that we needed. And the review process was a long involved 17 months of, from the draft release to the end, we actually went final, which, gosh, it was a month ago today, right? July 22nd. So, our time flies. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is something that has emerged in the last couple of years for us in particular, but it does seem to parallel some of the situations that Mike in particular was talking about in the first presentation. Uh, I've termed it modeling emerging policy directions and things that have not yet been translated into parcel level inputs that we've put into a model. So with that in mind, let me blow through the first couple of slides here that just give you the context of the region for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with uh, the area that we represent. Four counties, 82 municipalities, and you see the statistics there. Uh, our forecast is by 2040, we'll have close to 5 million people, we will have close to 3 million jobs, and Seattle should still be our largest city. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be the smallest, but it should be pretty close to it. 
our standard suite of models that we currently deploy, uh, the ones that have the color in them, are the ones that are the land use side that I work with in particular. We do use a, uh, an exogenous forecast, so to speak, a regional model that uh, provides our control tools to Earth, similar to, I think, most other folks' structure in the model. And we've got the, the four sequence parcel level model blocks that I highlight here. That's our current deployment of urban sand. So it's, I believe, kind of parallel to a lot of other folks that are using the parcel model. We have an opportunity to intervene, so to speak, off the bat of the developer model suite. We have development models where we can put in major plan developments that we're aware of. We run the real estate price model to do price predictions. We expected sales price and development proposal choice models to determine what gets built in that particular simulation year. Of course, construction model finishes it off. The transition relocation and choice models for household and employment take those annual control totals, swap in or out households and jobs as needed to match those control totals, and then goes through the relocation and placement processes. And then we've added a workplace location choice model suite at the end of the string. This was a couple of years back. Uh, and it was done to kind of basically transfer the home-based work location stuff that goes on in the travel model into the land use site so we could take better advantage of that, update it on an annual basis, and have that information available in our location choice models. This gives you an idea of the size of the tables that we're using now in the inputs. As I said, uh, we go up to 5 million, 3 million in terms of the jobs. Uh, I'm not sure how many buildings in the outdoors. Uh, it takes about 40 minutes still to run the simulation year for us, and we run a 40 year. We're still starting with the base year 2000, which I'll talk about in a second. So uh, we've been at it for a while. Um, and it does kind of break itself into phases. It's very similar to SEMPOT, I think. Um, our grid cell phase occurred from 2000 to 2006. And <clears throat> I think the key difference between us and SEMPOT is that at this point, we never really used the grid cell model for forecast. At this juncture, we made a transition to the parcel model with one eye towards this initial application that happened in 2009, which was our first uh, application for urban city transportation plan update. So at that point, when that ended, and in 2010 is where I want to spend most of my time here that I have left in the remaining slides, talking about once we finish that initial application, the transition piece that took us back into the research development mode, as I like to call it, making the changes that we became aware of as priorities in that first initial application, and then proceeding to get it to a point where we could use it for those forecasts. The last forecast we did do was in 2006 using the Grand and MCAL models, and we had been touting the advantages of urban sin in representing land use plans explicitly, which Grand and MCAL wasn't able to do. But we still had some work to get to the point where we felt like it was comfortable to use. So, after that first year of R&D, um, I think we found ourselves sort of uh, caught on the treadmill, so to speak. Uh, we, we kept uh, doing the, the, the routine of run, analyze, diagnose, scope out, modifications, rerun. And we were doing this with our, our LUTAC, our Land Use Technical Advisory Committee. And we knew we had a goal of producing a new forecast. We did not have a deadline necessarily establish a rigid schedule. And so while we were on this treadmill, at some point it just got to the, the groundswell consensus of when are we done? <laughs> when have we achieved what we need to achieve to use this for a forecast purpose? And so one of the, the lessons I think this drove home for us is establishing the finish line. And so there was a series of criteria that started to emerge based on these categories. Uh, the review of the model itself. The theory and structure, did we build the system right? Does it conform to theory? Sort of like structural validation is, I think, the term that we used. Uh, then there was the actual operational validation. And so we had a set of criteria that said, can we match our conditions? There was a, 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 a pro and a con to the fact that we started in the year 2000 base here. It was a, a strategic decision not to invest a lot of time to update that base year data that we had. A, originally been working with, and devote more time to the other aspects of urban said that we wanted to, to tip and to develop the model and the inputs of the land use plans themselves. And so that gave us a chance to run a 2020 
longer time period, and we compare that to the actual known observations and kind of work on a validation document, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. On that. And then the forecast. So there's the idea of um, matching it to, to professional expectations, to people who knew the area. Um, there's a lot of, of slippery slope in comparing your new forecast to the old one, but to some extent that kind of functioned as our, as our pre-existing set of uh, assumptions and understanding why they were different was an important part of this. And then in the sensitivity testing, you know, if we change uh, inputs, do we see the changes in the outputs? And uh, a lot of that kind of took its place as uh, improvements, modifications we would make to the inputs to see then if the model was reacting the way we wanted to. This actually turned into a checklist that again Matt Kitchen kind of spearheaded in the history of the agency. And this is a working version of it since uh, or taken, uh, September 2011. And it just kind of gives you an idea. I won't go through all of these in great length and detail, but it gives you an idea of the things that we spoke out in conjunction with Lutec and told them you know, when we are able to put a little check mark completed box in here, then we're ready to use this for a forecast process. So it kind of established that finish line for us. So reviewing the 2000 database, uh, going through the future land use development constraints file that we had, doing a final QC check, making sure we had a updated major plan development list in place that override the uh, pipeline of this at the very beginning of our development model, checking land and improvement values that were both input into the model and coming out as an output, just to kind of walk through one of these buckets for you. So we went through the functionality of the tools, the developer inputs assumptions, we made commitments to go back through and re-estimate all the models at that point to see how we were uh, basically to take into account all these new information modifications we had just put into play. And then a lot of supporting material that we were committing to drafting and working out at the same time. So uh, validation reporting, for example, something we call the gap analysis, which was comparing our forecasts to our adopted policies and plans. Um, so all of this became part of the, the, the contract, so to speak. The operational validation um, is a, a short tech memo that is available on our website. I brought one copy with me, and I really uh, can't wait to, to read it. Um, it was a very difficult period to do a validation to this. It's, I guess we have to start that up front, which is what the tech memo does. We have two recessions in the housing market. And to try to do a comparison of 2000 to 2010 during that time period was definitely a challenge. Um, there was a lot of, of debate. What are we looking at? Do we look at the total? Do we look at the change? What geography do we look at? We had to make a lot of incremental kind of compromise decisions as we went. Um, we had talked about the ability of urban sim, uh, modeling it again to the region, to the parcel level, and then building back up to come up with our reported totals. There's no sub uh, regional control totals that we were adhering to. So we had talked a lot about the ability of urban sim to produce output in various geographies and for the first time we're doing the city level forecast. But trying to validate all of those different geographies would have just uh, put us on a trip that we never would have gotten off of. And someone had had the uh, slide comment, Mike, I believe it was you, who talked about the resolution and the reliability of the record every year's activities, but something along those lines. And we encountered this heavily when we were in this particular process. In the end, we stuck with this FAS level validation as our criteria, and we actually, you know, after multiple iterations, we got to a point where we felt pretty comfortable with those results. The preview slide on the land uh, developer behavior modeling, and I think that um, I believe the consensus, again, I'm speaking for, for many folks that worked on this, but internally, we didn't really have a good idea <laughs> of those particular mechanical steps about how land development really works, or we didn't really know what the pro forma looked like, so to speak. And so we were, again, still using the, the original incarnation of the parcel level development model, I believe the original incarnation, the development templates, generating proposals, going into the pool, having weights assigned to them, and then that selection process playing out on an annual basis based on your interpretation of demand, which for us was at the regional level. And so the challenges we ran into in particular was mixed use. When a parcel can go both ways, when does it develop and what does it become? And are you getting the appropriate price signals into play that 
would represent the developer's decline rate of, well, the market for retail is high, but an office tower would give me three times that building on the road, but rents are rising. Which do I do? Do I wait? Do I jump? We have a lot of debate and discussion about that internally, and tomorrow I'll share what I would call our, our incremental steps to try to address that. Um, in particular, when that, that FAR is an allowable floor area ratio would be dramatically different across uses is where we really were, were struggling. And we also have to bear in mind that this mixed use land we're talking about represented most of our, a ton of our capacity, because it's usually in CBDs and it's usually some very high growth given our, uh, our regional plans. And when does that maximum, or less than maximum, building envelope pencil out? When does it make sense to build something that's substantially smaller than that envelope? And how do you represent density bonuses in the center zone? Because at this point, we had a fixed constraint that we had. This combination of all things that influence what you can do on a parcel, zoning, so plot plan, critical areas, all gets merged into that single value. So tomorrow, I'll go into more details about that, but that's my preview to say that, that was our, our other big technical challenge. The review process, again, I mentioned it took 17 months from the time that we put the first draft out there in March 2012. And we put a little bit of thought, in how are we going to explain such a complex modeling system to people who are hearing about it, who heard about it, but they knew what urban sim was. They didn't really know how it worked. They knew it was supposed to produce forecasts. And how do we dive them into this and ask them to start reviewing this draft forecast? It was kind of a two-part process that emerged for us. The first one was releasing the output, but also making available for this web mapping interface those inputs. So those development constraints that we explicitly were representing in this forecast effort. <clears throat> I'm asking them now to go through and comment on and give us those changes. So the first round of review was emphasizing point out to this output that looks strange and try to track it back to the inputs that we can display in front of you. I think it provided a good entry point for a lot of people that hadn't been plugged into our review process before. And by before, I'm saying back in 2006 when it was the grand mental days. And it gave them a very concrete starting point because everyone in a local jurisdiction can look at our representation of the comp plan and how we're representing it. And kind of make those judgment calls pretty, pretty clearly. Um, <clears throat> we gave them probably about a month to two months to do that, but then that put us on a cycle of not only making the improvements, but then also going through the process of evaluating the output that got flagged as strange and going back into the model development sequence and starting to continue to work on those requirements. So we had a parallel process going that took us until December 2012 before we got to the next review. Uh, draft release. And this focused on both inputs and outputs, but the shift was more onto the output side because at this point we had, again, consistent with that checklist, that contract, reached a point that said, okay, we need to get the forecast out. We've done what we can on the model side. And it's time to bust out the refinement tool. And so for us, the refinement tool was the post processing that we did to the output before it became a forecast. And we actually split this into two types. And um, the easiest way to describe, I guess, let's, let's just try to work through it this way. The 2010 refinement, we would run from 2000 to 2010, and we were already comparing those outputs to the validation results. And we would see then instances where the zone wasn't behaving properly, so to speak, compared to that observed data. And the idea was if we run a refinement at this point, correct the key metrics, households, population, and jobs for that particular zone, and then restart it in 2010 to 2040 to evaluate the validation and to do a correction and try not to propagate that validation error, so to speak, um, in the sense of land getting consumed that shouldn't have been consumed or vice versa, um, out to 2040. So it was an attempt to reset that. And again, Hana, uh, check. Chechakova on our staff um, was instrumental in going and developing a lot of that code and coming up with these refinement tools that we could apply. The forecast refinement was then flipping out to that 2040 output and the intervening years and working with jurisdictions at the FAS level to say what still doesn't make sense and can we trace this to something in the model that we're not 
properly represent. That also took on a form is something that I'll talk, attempt to talk about tomorrow, which is how Hana applied uh, the Bayesian melding process to come up with these confidence intervals. So you can see it illustrated here, light in a shaded gray. This is just an example of a form that we produced for people to do the reviewing. And our goal was to try to keep any refinements within that range. So we're still making refinements to the output, but we're not massively disagreeing with the model structure and the work that we did to get us to that initial output. We weren't always successful in keeping that dot within that gray range, but at least it provided a good starting point for the discussion about why do we need to move out of that range. It gave us kind of a logic trail, so to speak, to go back to. The last couple of slides I got talked about this, uh, this now the split in where we were in 2006. So the backstory is in Dram and Impel, again, not being able to explicitly put in representations of confidence. It was a hybrid of model. We can get down to it. We ran it to come up with a starting point for forecasts. We went through an adjustment process and we worked with the, the reviewers again. But at that point, you're making a judgment call about which bends of the trend you're going to put into play and which ones you're not. Which uh, emerging plans and policies, which major developments are going to come to fruition in the land, and which ones have less of a chance of doing that. We made a commitment in 2008 uh, when we were originally doing this application of the transportation plan to model our, our regional policy, it's called Vision 2040, yeah, or the regional growth strategy is the numerical representation of this. And so when we got to this point in 2009, we made some very coarse adjustments to the urban sim inputs that came up with what we called a regional growth strategy consistent distribution of land use that we then fed into the transportation models. Well, coming out of that, when it came time to that forecast, we realized that how are we going to translate down to a parcel level this policy direction that at this point exists as growth objectives and hasn't yet come down to comp plans and zoning changes. So to some extent, we're here in the previous Growth Management Act cycle. Um, the Growth Management Act, Washington State's law that requires regional planning out for a 20 year period. So we have a, a process where growth targets are, are adopted by the individual counties and cities from official projections put out by the state. It does get translated to current plans, and that's what we were holding into the same side. Now, on the flip side, they have just gone through the new OFM projections in 2012. Um, Vision 2040 was adopted prior to that and established the regional growth strategy, but now new targets are being updated consistent with vision the new forecasts and the confidence are going there. So uh, the theme seems to be on treadmill. And so if I return back to that, we saw another treadmill in front of us that we were in danger of climbing on, or potentially going to get off, which is how are we going to get consensus on how we're going to represent <coughs> plans that don't exist yet? Um, and can we do that in time to still get a forecast out? And so what emerged from this for us became an outside of urban sim product that we have dubbed the local targets representation for timing and uh, all that in a minute. Um, and it is a, a allocation of those particular targets down to zones that can also be fed into the model world. So now we've got uh, a land use forecast and that is produced by urban sim. And we've got the other kind of policy driven uh, aspirational allocation that is the local targets representation. And we are at a point now where we are got our decks cleared from doing the sprint to get to this forecast point. And now we're going to kind of be taking on the scoping out of where does urban sim go next? How does it fit in as a policy scenario simulation tool? How does it inform how we can get to the local targets representation again? Parallel to some things we already heard from the first two presenters. And so, if I take a few minutes and wrap up and allow for some questions, I'd be willing to interject if you'd like. Um, 
Predefining that finish line is something, again, that I think is, is important for us to come to that realization. So uh, it helped transition us from a R&D mode to a production mode. It helped to build up some confidence um, from our OTAC members. We would generate that confidence in the output. And part of that was committing to saying that while it comes to it, we will use a refinement tool to get forecast out. But that was important for them to hear as well. Uh, OTAC spent a ton of time helping us. And holding them early into the process was extremely valuable. And we went through the rollout of the product and this discussion about which of these two products now being used in what type of plan that's starting to emerge now. The review process was kind of labor intensive. Um, and again, there was a lot of discussion about the rule of forecast and appropriate level of refinement. Um, at the very end of the process, we were committing to doing a city level forecast and uh, we pulled it at the last second because we realized we applied the refinement to the FAS level. I mean, we looked at the city level and still had some issues. So I think that whole scale magnitude issue came up again there at the very end. And we're also realizing this alternative inputs consensus process and the fact that we uh, didn't have the strategy for kind of getting to that point. And uh, you know, going forward, it's something that's definitely in our work plan now starting to be similar. That policy scenario too. Um, so this time next year, this block right here should see a MR1 in it, which is maintenance release one, is what we're calling it. So now that we've got the forecast done, we're jumping right back in. And the idea is that we're going to put together a maintenance release now and come up with a schedule going forward of how we're going to, to maintain the forecast products package. And so the issues that we came out with from beforehand potentially could be some rebranding of these two products now because we're getting a lot of questions about two products which we need to reuse as the appropriate goal of each one in our plans and policies. At the same time, there was an awful lot of uh, demand, so to speak, or maybe preference expressed for having your incentive to turn into this policy scenario analysis important tool that we can use more. Um, we plan on diving back into the model improvement program, and our focus will be on the development model. Um, Mike, in particular, we're very interested in hearing more about the performance model, so we will take you down later. If anyone else that confesses to using an alternative development model approach, because we want to learn as much as we can when we dive into this next round of model improvement. Um, we got through the process with the 2000 base here, but we're going to dive back in and create an updated base here so that it works as well. And again, the scenario testing is, is definitely So ending up with a, uh, an opportunity to really to chime in, and uh, just a very quick recognition of the staff folks that I haven't mentioned yet that are all involved in what that's part of. Thank you. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, are we in trouble? Or? How much time? Okay. We're, we're okay. Okay, cool. Uh, so um, I'm fairly new at PSRC. I just started there in May, so it's ridiculous that my name is on the top of the slide because I've done the least on the models. Um, but thank you, I guess, or maybe I'm in trouble for that as well. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize just for a minute uh, what a quandary we are in at PSRC. I don't want to miss words about having these two separate products that we have right now. So uh, inside the building, uh, the technical staff that are working on the roads, including myself, have full faith that this model can do a lot of really interesting things for us, and we have not even begun to tap the capabilities of the tool. For example, this new forecast that we now have really encapsulates what we sort of consider a baseline. It's basically the no project view of what happens uh, in the future after 2040. The problem with that is that we just last month had this big release saying the model's finally working, it's done, congratulations, pat ourselves on the back, and it went over like a lead balloon because all of the regional staff and the different stakeholders outside of PSRC were like, you just spent all of this money and all of this time building a future that we've all agreed we don't want to see. <laughs> and I mean, it was quite literally like that. And then nobody inside PSRC has called Urbanson an abject failure, but I have heard that expression outside. And it's not because of the tool, it's because of the assumptions that we've put in this one alternative that we've created and uh, people who are not modelers, like the people in this room, have conflated the tool with the scenario. And so, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is that we now have this local targets representation, 
which is the vision, which I call the, the faith-based planning alternative of what you know the region is actually supposed to look like according to the you know the course traders who have come up with the different targets for each city. And now they want that to be the, the vision. Or actually, excuse me, that is the vision. And uh, it's now our task to find out, you know, just how far do we have to twist the knobs on this tool before we can make it match that exactly. And that's why I want to pick Mike's brain, because it sounds like here at ABAC they've already done that. Uh, and uh, I do not want to overemphasize how much trouble this tool is in because well, what I think I would have nothing to do with the technical challenges, but more sort of some of the policy directions and the so just the process through which we created urban over this very long arduous process. It's amazing to me because with all of this input from all these different LUTAC members and all of the different regional cities, you think that they knew exactly what we were building and why and what all the assumptions are, but that is not at all what has happened. So we have 12 or 18 months to get some, what I'm calling the urban sim stress test, you can call it scenario planning, to show that this tool can actually do the things we need it to do as an agency. And, uh, if we can't do it in that time frame, uh, well, let's not talk about that because I'm confident we'll be able to do it. <laughs> so I just wanted to throw that side in because uh, everyone here talks about the model and the different components and the inputs, uh, but this thing is not being developed in a vacuum, and uh, we really need to show as an agency that this tool is useful to our members, uh, or no one's going to want to use it. We were just at a meeting yesterday where everyone looked each other in the eyes one more time, and we're like. All right, so we're not going to use urban so we're going to keep doing the LTR alternative instead, and everyone agreed, yes, that's the right thing to do. Like, this tool is not being used yet. So it's interesting. Anyway, maybe we've been interesting times. That was really provocative. I'm sure that was going to raise some questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have several other questions, but in particular, Moro, and just on that note, I mean, we have a paper about the human versus model, and like, you know, the most valuable, and I don't know, I'm sure Urban Sim allows you to take some of those county level or city level targets and try to push that down and see. And then, of course, just reporting on differences in forecasts and your different policies rather than giving all the absolute numbers might be helpful with those stakeholders. So. Absolutely, and we have been agonizing over which is the most, uh, most helpful way to. Uh, explain the results of these runs, like is the delta what people can understand, or is the, the total number of housing units in your city the, you know, the more appropriate thing, or are both useful depending on your point of view. Uh, I definitely see a way out of this. Um, we, um, it's, I'm actually not too worried, uh, but there's just not a lot of credibility yet on the tool, like I said, outside the building. We're just not there yet. Have you been that constrained by the Topology that they're using, which might be county level, um, or they have their targets. Have you done that in urban sense? Yeah, um, no, not explicitly. We talked about it at some point, um, but I understand what your question was basically establishing like a control tool for the regional level. So, uh, the, the term in our vision strategy is metro cities, for example, and encompasses the five biggest, and controlling urban sense to make sure it hits those five numbers. Um, we talked about that as an option, and for a couple of different technical reasons and staff time-wise, we decided to continue on using urban sim just as that forecasting tool and allow a different process to that hand allocation. At that point, the, the LTR product, the local targets representation, was still kind of a complementary product. Its role has grown as we've kind of gone through the review and this process as well. Jason? Um, yeah, can you, can you talk a little bit more about the blue tack and the people who made that up and sort of their maybe a variety of technical ability for certain things that they decided to do? Yeah, uh, thanks. It's actually a good group that uh, I would try to acknowledge them all by name, but um, I won't miss it. Uh, primarily, what we drew on uh, was a body that met semi regularly called the Regional Technical had a technical bed, obviously, for the state as to planners in the, the trenches, so to speak, actually doing the analysis, implementing the policies, supporting the, that work with data and analysis. So we drew from demographers, uh, we drew from transportation planners, uh, we drew from, uh, I'm trying to think of that, all their specific job titles. We had a few uh, planning managers involved. But it was more of a, a, a non-elected body 
is definitely professionals that were involved. It was kind of a voluntary process. Uh, we had it by invite to start with. We had kind of selected people that we knew in the past were very interested, very tuned into PSRC's data uh, policies, uh, data program, and how their needs had been changing over time. Uh, we used some of them in the original RFQ process. Uh, we were sort of selected. And we basically use them a lot as kind of basically a on staff. Uh, but there is a mostly drawn from people that have been in the region for 10, 15 years, uh, perhaps worked for multiple jurisdictions, had forecasting data knowledge, but were also looked to as key uh, <coughs> contact points within their own organizations as to how to use PSRC products, where they have, have applied it in the past. So there was a wealth of knowledge there, not only on what we did, but what needs for outside of the agencies. And I think it's a critical perspective to have. Mark, can I just interject sure. and add to that? My recollection of that committee when I last saw them, this has been quite a while, that there were more technical staff. Yeah. Uh, data, That's right. you know, people that work with GIS, people that work with data, these were not manager and policy types. Right. And, and I have a feeling that part of the dynamic that you encountered was due to that. We were getting one view of the process through their lens and a different view from the policy makers. Uh, and you know, there was a little bit of a culture clash. I think that's a good observation. Uh, right, because this group did want to dive into the details, right? And didn't want to see every trail of smoke coming out to see if there was fire. Um, I agree. We need to light up the fewer barbecues, I think. <laughs> <laughs> How would you feel if you, uh, as part of the scenario, if you recreated or tried to recreate their vision through four or five different pathways, policy pathways? Do you think they would be? How do you think they would respond to that? That, that is exactly what I think our next step okay. is. We're doing this uh, this MR1 maintenance release, which is really just bug fixes, and we're trying to get that out by Halloween, which I think means it should be done by Christmas. Uh, so we're calling it the December Halloween release. And uh, once that's done, uh, the next step is to do the stress testing. Uh, and we actually want to put together some packages of policies very similar to what uh, some of you guys have done in this region and see uh, how close to the LTR we can get. The other thing that's happening in the MR1 release, in addition to the bug fixes, is uh, we're going to rename the two products to make it clear that the land use, what we're calling the forecast right now, is a is an embeds baseline assumptions. So we're renaming that to the land use baseline, and we're renaming the local targets representation of the land use targets. And we think that has a really clear message to people about you know the difference between the two. The fact that they've been created for completely different methods is less important to the policymakers than sort of the assumptions and results that they that you know that they in, in, in that's sort of the right word. And so that is exactly what we need to do next once that MR1 gets out, is try to create that vision and show people, look, this tool actually can do something like that. And you know, there's some findings on which combinations get us there you know, more accurately. And I think that would give us a lot of the, so the victory we need in terms of uh, being able to test the different land use policies. That's really what they thought they were buying. Um, they didn't think they were buying a forecast. They thought they were buying a tool with which we could use to help support informed decision making. Yeah. I think because we have limited time, we said, okay, what policies do you want? And then we'll fill in the back with kind of uh, constant subsidies. But if we had more time, it would have been great if we would have said, how far do you want to push this policy? And then we'll adjust. How far do you want to push this policy? To give them figures, the more ways you can recreate their future, <laughs> essentially the more viable they'll get. Yes. Yes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. So if you're transitioning, uh, next up we have uh, Maricopa Association of Governments and Tiny Lee and Jesse Ayers will be presenting. And uh, I'll let you get set up with that. But uh, just to reflect on the discussion in the last few minutes uh, and, and uh, Billy's comments in particular, um, I didn't realize now looking back on it just how prescient it was when ABAG and MTC were wrestling with exactly this dilemma of the vision on the one hand and the need to use analytic models and an EIR process to analyze different alternatives. And at the time, it was a source of a lot of friction, as apparently it is in, in many places. Uh, these are very different views of the future. 
Uh, one is what we want, and the other is what can we accomplish using different levers, using different policies and tools. And uh, you know, I think these have lived in fairly different worlds in the past. And uh, the challenge that we had to confront here in the Bay Area, and that I guess the PSRC is about to have to confront, is how to reconcile those. Uh, and I think it's actually a really interesting and uh, and much more useful kind of a, a, an engagement than it would be trying to treat them separately. Going through the exercise of having to wrestle with what kind of policies would actually accomplish these visions, and in some cases, learning perhaps that the visions might be a little bit unrealistic in some places, right? I mean, we have targets in the Bay Area of 80% of the new housing going into 5% of the land area and the priority development areas. <coughs> That's a very tall order. Uh, and so, you know, when these visions sometimes stretch a little bit, uh, having the ability to stress test the vision, as well as stress testing the models, uh, I think is a really productive kind of, uh, of back and forth. Uh, doesn't make the tensions between the views of planners and designers and modelers and policymakers go away, but I think it creates a, a much more constructive uh, way forward. So anyway, I don't know if we'll hear about some politics in the case of Phoenix. Phoenix has it all worked out. <laughs> but Jesse's going to work. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Excuse me, I'm building a little hole here, so bear with me. Um, we represent MAG here today. I'm Jesse Ayers. Uh, I've been with MAG for about five years now. Um, formerly was up in the Puget Sound area myself, working for Paul, and um, going to school up there a little bit. So that's a little bit about my background. Ani is here with me, Ani Lee. Uh, been at MAG about the same amount of time, a little bit longer. And uh, then our boss is in the back hiding uh, anabolic bagway. It's been, uh, been there forever. Um, so today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what's new and different in our application, I think, compared to some of the others that we've seen, some of the different things that we did. And um, tomorrow, a little bit more about the lessons learned. Um, first of all, we'll start with <coughs> A few quick facts about our region. Um, the newest projections that we did, the process of approval that we went through, and then we'll have some highlights of our application. <clears throat> so, first of all, um, we have 25 cities and towns, three new communities, although that number is increasing. We just added um, three new members to our NPO from the uh, county out to the south called Pinal County. Um, so prior to that, we were just uh, Maricopa County with a little bit of spillover, but now we, we're expanding a bit. Um, these are really quite large counties. Maricopa County is 9,200 square miles. Pinal County is uh, 5,300 square miles. And um, a very high growth region. Um, starting in 2010, we had about 3.82 million people <coughs> and expecting by 40 or over 6 million. And on the job side, in the blue there is 1.7 million to 3 million plus by 2040. And um, next up is our uh, official projection process. This, this, this slide represents several years' worth of work. Um, we, we start by reviewing all of our data with our member agencies and our pop tech. Um, we, we meet with them pretty much monthly. And we have certain data sets that come out every year, like our general plans, uh, existing land use, we have residential completions database, we have a lot of information about developments. And these are our data sets that our GIS folks um, do for us, and then we review them with our contact. So all of the data that goes into the model um, is reviewed on an annual basis. And these data sets are useful for all sorts of other planning purposes that our member agencies are interested in. <clears throat> but we ultimately feed it all into the model as well. So right from the very beginning, we're constantly reviewing data with our PopTac. And our PopTac is similar to the LUTAC that uh, Mark just mentioned. So all of these things get reviewed constantly. Um, so that, that all occurs up here on the left, this all the green stuff, is really about data and data review. And in our official projections process um, is really represented by the right-hand side of this slide. And I'll spend a little bit more time on that. Um, our projections are driven primarily by two things. Uh, first of all, our transportation modelers and air quality modelers needs. They, have a, they, they require a lot of data from us. 
Um, but uh, second of all, and, and easily it's just as important, is there is an executive order in Arizona that uh, specifies that every two to three years, correct me if I'm wrong, and um, we have to do this. We have to produce an official set of projections that everybody agrees on. And every NPO in the state does this. We're just, we're just one of the six, I believe, or seven that do this process. And um, we end up, at the end of this process, with a single set of projections that everybody has reviewed and agreed upon, and they get used for the transportation planning and air quality modeling and planning as well. Excuse me. So in the end, we, we're, everybody is, ends up being required to use these numbers uh, that we produce out of this. And so th this, this process uh, has existed for quite a while at MAC. This isn't, this isn't really brand new. Um, we've just inserted a brand new model into this process. And so we didn't really change anything about the process. We just kind of changed the model. And that came with some challenges that I think we'll probably talk about a little bit more tomorrow. But for the most part, it went really quite smoothly. Um, but over the past year or so, um, this is this is about the work we've done, um, starting in mid-December, excuse me, of last year. We received control totals from the state, and the executive order. We're going back to that. It states that the uh, Arizona State Demographer, excuse me, has to produce population control totals that everybody is required to use at the county level. So we're stuck to these numbers at the county level, something that we have to use. So really, just as soon as, as, soon as these numbers hit, which was in mid-December of last year, yeah, we're off and running. We're in a production mode at that point. And the executive order states, I think the actual language states something like, we have nine months to get this process done. Um, but that means all the way through all of the committee process. So we give ourselves about six months, really, to get it into our pop tag and group there. And then, and then it makes its way <clears throat> on up the line. <coughs> Excuse me. So we received our county control totals in mid-December. And um, so we were off and running right away. Um, by the end of January, uh, we delivered our draft one. And you see, as you can see here, we went through several drafts, uh, one, two, and three. Um, in the first draft, we only reviewed the first decade. And we, from past experience, um, not my personal experience, because I'm new to the process, but from Anabob's experience, uh, we get the best feedback in the draft one about the near term. So we spent quite a bit of time uh, meeting with the member agencies. Uh, we, we met with most of them, and we, we either physically went to their, their offices or they came to us. And we sat down with ArcGIS with the forecast in it, all the data that, that is in there, all the developments, all the, all the stuff I described this a second ago that they've all you know, agreed is, is correct. And we just went over their city with them live. And we found that to be really useful um, and we, we end up with really great feedback from that. And um, the challenge becomes what to do with that feedback once we have it. <clears throat> and that, that turned out to be quite challenging. Because once we, once we go out there with seven members, they tend to have legs or wings. <laughs> and they, you know, people, you know, you put them out there and they, you know, you're suddenly stuck to them if, if uh, they approve this number or they agree that this is the case. So in draft two, we come up with something different than that. And that kind of becomes a problem for us. It's, it depends on the member agency, of course. Some are you know, stickier about that, if you will. Others are a little looser. But it was a real challenge, actually, um, to have a set of numbers come out for 2020, and then we go back, try to adjust the assumptions in the model, and then hit those targets again, starting from 2010, and then going further out to 30 and 40. So, we feel like we mostly did that. It was, it, it was a lot of work. Um, we, we got a lot of work done in that, in that month in February. And by March, um, we went back with draft two. And you know, this time around, we, we didn't meet with as many, as many folks. We would have met with them all, but uh, so, some people felt you know, good about it, others didn't. So we, we met with four at least this time around. This time around, we delivered all the way out to 2040. And I, I should clarify that we only did decades. We just did 10, 20, 30, and 40. And we didn't do, you know, down to the parcel on every single year or anything like that. Um, then going further, uh, we took a little bit more feedback. Of course, you know, further on the future we get, the less certainty there is about what's going to happen. So we didn't get quite as much feedback 
And we did a draft three, which we were pretty confident was going to be our final our final set. A couple of major member agencies had, had a little bit more to input, but that was about it. And finally, um, by May, we had approval from PopTac, and then it's gone to our management committee and our regional council. And I think, did that just happen yesterday in the that they approved it at regional council? Okay, yeah, so this is just right up to, I mean, they, they did this back in June, but uh, it, it really finished, I think, yesterday in, uh, in this process. So really, that's that's just sort of an overview of the process that we went through. It's a really tight time frame. Um, that placed some constraints on us that um, I think you probably see in some of the some of the modeling decisions I think we were forced to make at the time. And uh, we're going to learn from those and keep moving forward. So beyond that, uh, what we're going to talk about further is some of the new stuff that we put into the model, um, some of the stuff that we have built for us, and, and the things that we used. Talk, Honey is going to help us out here with a little bit of uh, talk about our data preparation and synthesis tools. Um, we have uh, then a, a few more slides about the way we set up our model system. Um, we did this thing called super parcels that I'll talk a little bit more about that are aggregations of parcels. Um, some of the real estate development models that, that we wrote in-house to help us um, help us with the real estate development side and some special populations uh, that, we, that we added in. So with that, I think Hani is up with a couple of uh, slides about data projects. So we need to prepare some basic data for urbanization uh, and uh, on the cloud for the forecasting years. So the data preparation part mainly includes uh, population, households, and jobs. So for the population and households uh, allocation, we went through two stages. The first one is uh, done by ASU's popgen, and uh, that will bring the countywide population down to the rock roof level. But we did not use the block roof geography because we have matched have population at the sense of base level. Unfortunately, some block roofs are cut by the sense of base boundary. So we have to create our pseudo block roof uh, geography. The reason we call it a pseudo block roof is uh, uh, majority of those are still, uh, are still block roofs, and only those block roofs that are cut by sense of base boundary are, sp are split into pseudo block roofs. So the data we use um, is from census <coughs> and also APS, uh, 06 to 25 year um, time sample data and also the uh, marginal distribution data. So census data is uh, uh, April 2010. We need to bring the data to uh, July 2010. So we use our residential completion data uh, and apply the uh, vacancy rate and the household size factor uh, to that data to bring the census April 30 to July 2010. Uh, ASU PopGen had this advantage of uh, considering both households and uh, person attributes. Um, the results shows uh, the exact match on total number of households at pseudo group level and a close match of total number of population at pseudo group level. So our next step is to go from the pseudo group down to the parcel level. And uh, we have a tool developed by our consultant, which is called a household locator. And in this uh, step, we bring the households and the population down to the parcel level. And uh, the method it uses is similar to uh, what SEMPOP used. And uh, it just checks the path data to check what kind of uh, housing unit a household uh, resides in. So, it will compare the household attributes and the dwelling unit attributes in order to assign a household to a dwelling unit. And after this, we still have some mismatch of the total number of population at the suitable level. So the tool will adjust the population number up or down. For the jobs, we did not go to two stages. We just go directly from county down to the parcel level. Originally, we just uh, developed the control total at the county level by names. But the results, we were not uh, very satisfied at the title level. Uh, so we developed a 
another level of uh, control total, which is the total number of jobs at the tiles level. So we throw both control totals into the tool in order to give us a very reasonable result at the tiles level. And the control total, um, which was created by our um, regional economist, uh, um, used as a source of Q uh, QCE data and ACS data. Um, for the sample data, we um, used uh, our employer database, which covers the majority of our county jobs. Uh, the source of it is from Dan Bradstreet and our, our trip reduction uh, project, and also from cities. So the method it uses is uh, it will allocate the geocoded employer points to the buildings. Um, it could be simple, like if uh, employer point falling on the parcel is just one building. So it's simple to allocate that employer point to that building. But if there are multiple buildings on the parcel, then it will use the pre building preference system, which could be created by the user of the, be the analyze, um, analytical results from our uh, employer database to assign a building to a parcel with multiple buildings. Um, also, the after uh, the the coded employer points are assigned to a building, we still have some deficit between the assigned jobs and the control total. So the deficit will be prorated. Um, we did not run the business model in urban scene. Uh, so in this tool, we just prorated the jobs, but we do have the option to do the uh, the business match too. So after all this finished, the building per feet and also the value of the building will be adjusted based on um, the assigned jobs to each building. We still have a, a special population left not uh, allocated yet. So for seasonal trending, road cultures, and uh, airport employments, uh, we pretty much just use the weighted allocation uh, method to allocate them to down to the parcel level. The data source, uh, like uh, for group cultures and seasonal population, we use uh, census data. For transient uh, population, we got the data from Arizona Department of Tourism. Uh, after all the synthesized uh, process are done, we have the data at the parcel level. But our the uh, offers model is the zonal model. So you need to bring data from the parcel level up to our zone, which is the super parcel level. So we have another tool, which is called a zone assembler tool. It aggregates the jobs and the households from the parcel level up to the zone level. And also it will create a, a, the scheduled development events table, which tells the urban scene what kind of building capacity for each year. Uh, the offers development model can be found. So after this, we are ready to go with the model um, configuration, estimation, and the simulation. So I'll let Jesse keep talking about all the fun stuff. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> uh, one one thing I wanted to add here about the, the zone assembly before I before I move on is that uh, we, all the all the tools that that Honey just was, just described we were very careful. Um, to build these things so that we're creating data at the lowest level possible down to the down to the parcel. And this zone assembler, we can as long as we put the geography on the parcel in the beginning, this tool can aggregate to any any zone. So if we, if we felt like running a TAS level model with urban sim, we could just tell the zone assembler aggregate the stuff to TAS. If we wanted to run a parcel model, we could just leave it alone. Um, what we did is someplace in between. Sometimes when we say zones, we mean we mean super parcels. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. But these uh, this tool is pretty flexible. All, all these tools that we built prior to this are, are all pretty flexible and allow us to aggregate really, really to almost anything that we feel like any geography we feel like putting in there. And coming out of zone somewhere, we have probably ninety percent, not more, of the database structure that we need to run urban sim of this, which is pretty handy. There's just a few more things like estimation tables and some of the things that we have to put together after that. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we can figure our model here, our simulation process. Um, we did what a, a multi-level modeling. 
and it's been alluded to in a couple of previous presentations here. At some call, I think they did the uh, county level um, sub area control totals. We took this 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 idea a little bit further, and we uh, our our we did a sub area geography that we called market areas, and uh, these are our two counties right here. Um, those are the market areas. Um, there's 59 of them in Pinal, or I'm sorry, uh, Maricopa County and 15 in Pinal County. These these aggregate up to the municipal planning areas, and we configured an entire model system to just allocate from the county to these to these market areas as a first shot, and um, it's still fully disaggregate with in terms of jobs and households. So we're allocating from the from the county to the market area. Um, what we don't have in, in this model is buildings or an explicit um, real estate market simulation. So all we did really is assign capacities to each one of these market areas that says by year, how many households or population can we have here? And same thing for jobs. How many jobs can this market area have by type? So we ran this with, um, it's primarily driven just by the household and employment location choice models and they located directly to the market area with no in-between building um, like we've seen in a lot of the other stuff. And, and this, um, this is really fast to run. This was just one of the advantages to it. Um, we can get results out of this thing for 30 years in about an hour. Um, and we can you know, really rapidly run this thing, look at the results at a high level, share them with member agencies if we want to or, or other folks in the office. And um, you know, really, really kind of hone in on, on what we what we like to see uh, with this upper level model. What, what we then do with with the results of this is we just turn these into control totals at the market area, and then we run a more detailed simulation, um, market area by market area after this, which I'm going to explain next. And so our lower level is is simulation is, is much more like um, what what we've heard already. Uh, this is a full on um, super parcel, building, agent kind of data structure, which I'll go over a little bit more. Um, the unique thing I think about this is our super parcels. Um, we, we originally had been working with the parcel level data, um, and ultimately we just decided um, through a lot of testing that um, we, we really kind of felt like it was not giving us a heck of a lot in terms of detail for the extra runtime and, and, and um, things that you have to set up and run it. So we, we aggregated parcels by uh, land use. And so they, it ends up being kind of like a, a neighborhood level. Um, super parcels, sometimes you know, we, we, we make sure that they got split by important geographies, tasks, and anything we could anticipate needing in the future. Try to get all the geographies out here. Um, Despite that, we, we still had some very large areas uh, of, of land out in Western Park County that we still had to subdivide because they were just really too big to consider by themselves. We used PLSS uh, land sections to do that. Um, so uh, moving on just a little bit more here about super parcels. This is an example of sort of the database, and I think we'll probably recognize our little, our little people down here. We, we've certainly borrowed that quite a bit from uh, PSRC and, and <coughs> presentations and others. So. Uh, Thank you for that. Um, so here is an example of a super parcel. What we'll end up with here is a, a single plot of land. Let's say it has like 10 units here, which is, which is what this roughly has. So we'll have one record for the super parcel, but one record for the building. The building will have 10 units on it. And then we'll have you know, however many households attached to that same building record in this way. So we still get a pretty disaggregate representation with uh, not quite as many super parcels. I think the previous slide said we had about 100,000 in the region, which is about, I think, probably 10% or less of the actual parcels. Um, I think we have about 1.2 million parcels for the county, and uh, so we end up with about 100,000 in super parcels. And um, so why did we do this? Well, part of the reason is that um, we were inserting a new model system into an existing process. And this is some, this is the way that, that modeling has been done in Mac quite a while with the previous model system. <coughs> and so everybody's really used to this, this idea of stepping down into, uh, into, into detail. Um, we also feel like it makes sense just from a decision-making standpoint. When I moved down there, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't just go from the county and start choosing homes all over the region. I, I chose more or less a city that I felt comfortable with and then started looking at homes. So um, it seems to make theoretical sense to us. 
Um, as I mentioned before, we tested a lot of configurations in the past um, before we did this, and, and, and ultimately settled on this. Um, and plus, it, it, it's pretty quick. I, I think we get um, it, it varies between 30 and 60 minutes per year um, for this for this model, um, which isn't too bad. And <coughs> I don't think so. I don't think I made clear that um, the, the model itself, once we have these control totals at the market area level, um, our model goes market area by market area and runs the entire set of models for each one of these. So despite having to iterate across 59 market areas, it's still pretty quick uh, with that. So moving on just a little bit, um, one of the things we, that we added a while back, we, uh, Paul's group did for us a couple years ago on a task order, was added a whole set of demographic evolution models. And these are out there for, for anyone to use. They'll, they'll work in a zonal model or work in a parcel model. Um, we made sure those are pretty generic when we did it. And I think uh, Eddie did most of the most of the coding for us. I'm probably slightly later. But uh, thanks to him, he's, he's got done did a lot of work in a short amount of time on this. And what you see down the right hand side here is uh, a, a listing of the, all the individual models that, that he coded up for us and uh, calibrated to our, our county level. Um, so aging models are really simple, just add one. That, he didn't even need to do that, that was in there. Just add one to the age of every person. There's a fertility, mortality. So with fertility, we're predicting you know, which, which households will have, children, will have a child. Mortality, we pick people off. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, there's an education. <laughs> More or less, that's what that's what happens. Choose who's gonna who's gonna get to lead the town. Um, there's an education model that predicts an educational level, uh, marriage. So we're actually matching up if a person is creating with with one another to create a new household. Um, then we're breaking people up in the same way uh, with the divorce and the breakup, marriage and cohabitation, child leaving home to create a brand new household um, is one. There's a roommate model. Um, that matches up people uh, into new households. And then there's uh, a couple more models that do with household workers and household income. The vast majority of these uh, are work on a rate, a rate basis, so we can specify a rate table. I'll go over this in the next slide. Uh, with the exception of the household workers model and income, income is a standard regression model, and the uh, workers model is a uh, multi million budget model that chooses how many workers will buy in each household. <coughs> Real quick, just to show you how these, these, each one of these models work, we specify a table. In, in the purple here um, that shows four all kinds of different attributes of persons. And you can do this for any, any attributes you have uh, in your database and have data for. We specify a probability, and then um, ultimately it randomly selects enough persons that, that match this and creates a new person record for them as a new child and, and specifies the initial values, you know, like age, and the, sort of the bare minimum stuff that, that, that we need to do. To get that done. And each, each of the models work in a very similar manner. We just specify a table and um, then it just does what it needs to do to match people up and with, with various methods. Some of them are a little bit more complicated than that and how they work. But uh, that's really the gist of it. And I think, I think these got built in a manner where um, in the future with some more work, I think we could, rather than specifying a rate table like this, I think we could. Uh, you know, use use another model to sort of uh, determine these probabilities uh, dynamically, uh, rather than specifying this up front. Um, that required more work, but I think it's all been written in a generic enough manner to where that would be terribly difficult to do. <coughs> um, some of the other enhancements we made were to the real estate development model uh, process. Um, we used a different real estate development model than has been talked about today. Uh, it's a little bit uh, older. I think it dates from the, the grid cell model. And um, the, the list of the models is down here at the bottom. Um, starts with a real estate price model. The ones, the two in red are the ones that we added um, and wrote in-house uh, to sort of enhance this, this uh, model process a little bit. So um, we were running with the standard developer model by itself at first. And what we found was is that um, it, it just didn't do a very good job, especially in the near term, of predicting the development where we kind of know it's happening, and particularly where the cities know it's happening. So we wrote this active developments model to help us do that. It really sort of prioritizes developments that we know are happening either now across the base here or we'll start very soon. Um, and then we also <coughs> went to, to a little bit of redevelopment 
um, action in, in, in the model as well. And uh, we, we wrote one of those in the end. I'll explain a little bit more about this too. So one one of the things that we should emphasize about our region is we have a lot of land available. We have a pro-growth region, tons of land, um, and I think that oh, my, oh, sorry. <coughs> We have a lot of land available in, in pro-growth cities. And as you can see in the white here, this is all developable land. And uh, we, we found the, the existing model set to um, just, it, those areas really became really attractive in some of the other models that we were running. And that's what we felt we needed to um, add in some of our own, our own models. So here we go. So we wrote this and specified and wrote this active developments model. These are, these are developments that we know are starting soon or have already started. And really, it just, we, we have a configurable percentage of the total demand that we'll, that we'll satisfy with this model. And I, I think we set it at 50%, 1%, 80 We did some tests. And um, that way, we, we have some of the known developments getting developed and some other things in the general plan getting developed as well. So we, we, kind of, we get a mix of, of, of all things. And it just works in a standard manner. Vacancy rates get computed and compared to a target. Um, it determines how many units are, are required. And then it really just allocates them to the, the uh, active developments that we've that we specified. And then since we're not satisfying all demand with this model, we have the rest of the standard, if you will, um, uh, model process that runs here. And it, it does the same thing. It computes the remaining demand that, that is needed randomly selects projects, and then there's a series of location choice models that locate these projects. Um, and the building construction model follows up. It's really kind of an accounting thing. It just increments the, the number of units uh, as, as needed. And then, and then finally, this redevelopment model, this is kind of complicated to explain, but um, we, we, really, we really wanted to get this in here. And so we, we sort of divided redevelopment up into two different forms of redevelopment, only one of which this covers. So one is this, this covers a sort of a known redevelopment areas where we know that uh, through a plan or some sort of project that this parcel and this building is going to get demolished and it's going to get replaced with something we already know. So that is the kind of redevelopment we addressed here. Not sort of a market-based redevelopment where just through, um, you know, the deterioration of structure or, or a ratio of, uh, you know, building value to land value or something like that. And so the, the model is not making redevelopment decisions on its own in that manner. And so really, this, this does just that. If, if, if any of the previous models, if any of those chose development on a redevelopment parcel, this really just comes back behind it and does the accounting for us. It just deletes some of the uh, records proportionally and displaces some of the occupants. Um, so we, we have an overload of the parcel. So it's, it's really pretty simple. We have some documentation on this, if anybody's interested in, in seeing how this works. So finally, um, we did a whole slew of submodels that, that Honey alluded to. Um, these were primarily driven by our travel modelers' needs. So they, you know, they want information about transient population, uh, group quarters, um, all sorts of different things, and claimants. And, and <coughs> these are mostly weighted allocation models. Um, we did do kind of a special thing with seasonal population. We have a high seasonal component of, of our population that is there you know, between two and six months or a year. Two weeks <coughs> and six months a year, I think, is how we divide it. And uh, this, we, we actually loaded the seasonal population right into our household and uh, person tables. And so it, we, we really wanted them to participate in the real estate market in the same way that everybody else does. Because they occupy, I have seasonal units in my neighborhood. Um, and it's not, you know, anything, it's not any kind of special uh, retirement area or anything like that. So they're all over our regions. Um, we have an external schools model that we added, uh, kind of a little bit late in the game. So we, we did not integrate that into urban sound. That's something we'd like to do. Um, I think if we have time here, we just have a few slides about our population concentration and employment concentration, and, and the, all these maps were developed with the latest set of projections. Um, we have 2010 population, and we step through the decades here with a 20 and a 30 and a 2040. So quite a bit of downfill, but also a lot of growth on the uh, urban edge as well. 
and a similar story with employment in 2010, 20, 30, and 40. So a little bit more concentrated in the downtown areas, but definitely some uh, nodes out, out in the west and other parts of the, the region that are getting by the employment as well. And I think that wraps up today's presentation. We'll talk a little bit more about sort of the lessons learned and a little bit more detail tomorrow about some of these things, but we just want to these items now. And if we have time, we can take some questions that I need to answer and I'd like to try All right, thank, thank you. you. Yes, um, this goes back to the job synthesizer. So we had QCEW in this. Um, we are facing increased requirements on our own uh, from the security department in terms of what data we can use and not use now in suppression. And I'm just curious if your uh, job synthesizer had to work around that in way. Um, you actually come up with a way to still assign the jobs and still connect the around it with confidentiality. Right. We, um, as far as the QCW data, um, it's something that I, I think we obtained that sort of in the middle of the process. Is that right, Anna? We, we were having trouble getting those things, and so we have a our employer database is primarily made up from down at Bradstreet and some review with um, with our member agencies that we can kind of really do that. So the vast majority of our employment comes from that. We kind of use QCW really as more of a check on things, not directly. So it was primarily done in Bradstreet data that went into the actual base your database. Even on Dollar State, that you know, we're running to that problem. We just finally start getting the data. Just, yeah. yeah. It took a while to get it. But because of that, we had already built enough resources that our database does pretty well. Pretty much as Jesse said, we see them fill in the ranks, but we never share the data ourselves. So we only share our data resources. You mentioned one hour one time for 30 year simulations and the course topology, and I was wondering is that without a job demand model because oh, yes. traffic times don't vary much, and so you were concerned or they don't have much of an impact on your recent predictions? Yeah. Yeah, that, no, that does not include any kind of travel, travel demand model. And you're not worried way. because. It doesn't have much of an effect, or they don't change much with so much capacity there? Well, I think that's that's part of it. Um, I didn't quite tell the whole story there, of course. Um, there, there's We do have some variables in there, um, but given the course level of geography, it's really tough to get travel times from the TAS level and aggregate and ran a lot, a lot of issues with that. So we had to, we had to rely upon some um, uh, course or, um, measures of, of accessibility that sort of aggregated up to those those levels. Did I address that right, Anwar? But we are integrating with the travel demand model. We right. have that, but again, stopping and running to stop the model and run the travel demand model. The travel demand model takes about a day, day and a half to get through. So do that and bring that data back in. But what the way we got around in this short time period was we reloaded the travel demand model. So we would say, okay, draft one run travel demand models while that draft one is running, you know, again, we are doing everything. Do the same thing with draft two. So kind of use <coughs> match travel demand model rather than just right there, right then, except in the final one. So it's pretty well with that. I'm just wondering how often you update your demographic models because there's some uh, trends that no model can account for. Um, I'm thinking particularly of uh, the big one now is increased participation of over 60 uh, age people in the labor force. Uh, more and more children are being born to uh, non-traditional households. Uh, I think actually now it's greater than those uh, kind of traditional family households. <clears throat> no demographic model to account for that. That's right. You know, we uh, this is just this is really brand new, so we haven't gone through an update process with that yet. Um, it's something we'll definitely do before we do this again in just a couple of years. We only have a couple of years before we're sort of in production again on this. Um, but I think we I think we'd like to do some more work with those models as well. Um, they some, sometimes they produce some unexpected results at lower levels of geography when we really started digging in to see what was happening. It was also kind of challenging just to find out exactly what they did. 
uh, when, you're, when you're left with a whole series of just household and person tables that all those models had acted on, um, you know, with just that and the logs, we had, we had a tough time just exactly figuring out what happened sometimes, other than the, the overall trends. So um, we'd like to do more work with that for sure. Beginning stages. Yeah. Throw in a question from somebody listening remotely. This is actually from Anna. Uh, what is your experience with the demographic models? Were you able to compare the results with running the suite to running without? Yes. Um, in, in general, uh, they performed very, very well at the county level. They were, that's where they were calibrated on. Um, and you know, when we looked at results at the county level, I think for the most part, we got what we expected. Um, stable measures that we, we expect to be stable, like persons per household and things like that, stay pretty stable with slight trends and you know expected trends in one, one way or another. Um, but when it came when it came time to start looking at the results at lower levels of geography, that's when we realized, you know, wait a minute, what we're seeing here isn't quite what we expected in some ways. And maybe just as an example of that. Um, Let's see. So, in particularly like in age restricted areas where we had a high concentration of uh, older folks living in, in an area, um, you know, the, the uh, death model, if you will, predicted quite a few, quite a few uh, deceased folks in these areas. And then um, when, it, when it came time, you know, you remove one of the persons from this household, but then, then the other spouse would, would stay there, of course, and occupy and continue to occupy that housing unit. Well, maybe, maybe that doesn't always happen in reality. They may move out at that point and get another unit. So we, we, we didn't, it would lower persons per household significantly in some areas very rapidly. Um, and uh, that's just sort of one example. I think just in general, one of the big lessons from that is that they really need to be estimated and, and examined in a full model system along with your household location choice models and any relocation that you're doing. Um, it, it needs to be done in an integrated way, and we, we kind of ran out of time for that um, right, at, right at the very end. We have very tough, tight time constraints, and um, we ran out of time to do really much of the integrated testing that we would like to do with it. So I hope that answers your question. Great, good question. All right, well, good. So thank you. Thank you very much. Amazing when we're uh, actually on schedule. Uh, it's impressive. Must be a bunch of planners and modelers in the room. Um, so, in the handouts that were available at the front table, when you got an agenda, you also saw that there was a little map of restaurants. Uh, so, lunch is uh, sort of at your discretion. You can go uh, wherever you like. We did accommodate a little bit longer lunch break, so. Both you can have time to get out, stretch your legs, uh, have some lunch, and get back here. And also for the socializing that inevitably will be going on. Um, so uh, we're free to uh, go out, enjoy lunch, and be back here at 1.30. We'll try to start promptly because we do have still a pretty full program in the afternoon. So um, make your way out for lunch. Uh, Mike or David, do you want to say anything about the logistics? Or we're not going to lock the door, or are we? What we probably could if we want to, but we won't unless. Yeah, I think if you have valuables, you should probably take them just so that yes. nobody's liable for anything. Um, and I don't know if we're going to have any of our groups that, that are going to stay in the room uh, or not. But uh, to be on the safe side, if you've got a laptop or something, you should probably take it. We'll see you at 1:30. Thank you.
Good. I'm very good looking. So we're not using this anymore. Okay. Let me shut this down.
There's two. You know, I'll try restarting that. <laughs> Thank you. 